joining the party. Thank you for your availability and for sharing your expertise with us. To the faculty members of the various higher yeah. education institutions, yeah. not just in Davao region, but all throughout the country, to the men and women, the chapter 11 and headed by Dr. Luis Guterres in the administrative team, headed by Dr. Emma Pudin Sobre, with special mention to Dr. Evelyn Kekle, Dr. Seta Aditi Bokort, and Engineer Rod Amundibon, Education Supervisors of this office, who did a great job in spearheading the conduct of this 12 webinar. To all of you, wherever you are, who are watching, listening to this webinar, I hope you are always in the best place. Good morning, everyone. For those who are not able to log in the Zoom, you can view, download all our webinars on the Jedro 11 YouTube channel. Today's webinar entitled Empowering Teachers with New Strategies in the New Normal still part of Chedro 11's existence in the recruiting of the HEI's personnel and to Chet's aspiration that we will learn as one. This webinar is important especially for faculty members who are requesting our office. Conduct webinars that will enable them to learn and apply new strategies in the new normal. So on the first day, which is today, Dr. Greg Tabus Awilin of the UP Los Banos will talk on evolution of pedagogy and teacher education at the period of COVID-19 pandemic. This will be followed by the talk of Mr. Ruel Adonai of the Ed Central Office on outcomes-based assessment and flexible learning. On the second day, Ms. Christina Aligada Hanal of Moya College will talk on modeling effective classroom management in a synchronous and synchronous learning mode. This will, this will be followed by the talk of Dr. Uh, Jonah Marie Lin of St. Escalade College on creative strategies for teaching student teachers in a flexible learning mode. Thank you so much once again, Rex Bookstore Incorporated, for this partnership. For the information of everyone, Rex Bookstore Incorporated aims to put more value on their services by taking part in the education of faculty members. They have so much resources in terms of authors or experts and practitioners, as well as books for references. As Chedro 11 continues to serve its stakeholders, and as we continue to live by our tagline, we find solutions. We are hoping for your useful support and cooperation to whatever initiative our office will do, especially in this time. Please do watch, listen, attend, participate again to our incoming webinars. Thank you, everyone, for making yourselves available. Of a productive webinar on tips and comments. Thank you, RD, for that words of welcome. That was our regional director, Dr. Maricar R. Castejo. Another message from the regional sales manager for Mindanao, Higher Education Division of Rex Bookstore Incorporated. Please help me welcome by virtual applause, Mr. Ronald Eugenio, sir. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank you, thank uh, Commission of Higher Education Region 11 for again giving us the opportunity to be partners in presenting out the uh, uh, needed points or topics na para sa ating mga guru at mga professors, no? And I, I would also like to thank uh, Regional Director Casquejo and the officers of Ched Region 11 for, again, the opportunity of, and of course, ATE, uh, Association of Teacher Education, the Region 11, for this opportunity. Now, uh, sige, welcome, uh, unga, unga pala yung mga audience natin, welcome po, and thank you for joining this webinar, two-day webinar. 
Now, uh, ang key takeaway ko lang po is since yesterday, no? Uh, may slide na pinakita, no? the last, the least, and the lost. It struck me, no? it struck me, lalo, and this pertains to our students, no? mga, bat, mga college students. Tapos lumabas din yung word kahapon na tiwala. Tiwala on the teachers and tiwala on the students. These things I cannot uh, I cannot help but correlate. No? I've been in the sales industry for a very long time. No? May mahuhulaan nyo. Ang edad ko, pero I started in the in the sales industry at 19, ano, 1988. And you know what? Ano ba ang pagkakaiba ng new normal sa old normal natin ngayon? No? Basically, ang pinakamalaking factor dito is we have limit, limited or no face-to-face -face at all with our students and co-peers in the industry. Kung, kung sakali, no? Bakit ko nire-relate sa sales, sa career ko sa career sa sales especially here if you if you are here in the in Bismin or in the province you know? Kami po sa sales bihirang bihira din magkita I I I I seldom see my team simply because iba-iba ang ano ng sa buong Mindanao pero ika nga may I have trust in them and they have trust in me. I also teach them on methods on how to attack or achieve the goals needed to be achieved. Pero again, pag hindi nila ginawa yung dapat gawin, they will be considered part of the last, the least, and the lost. But I'm happy to say that this team here in Mindanao have been doing its have been performing consistently for the past few years so ano lang ang ibig kong sabihin tiwala lang even if we we are not seeing each other face to face araw araw you can relay your message you can teach your students and you can Make them effective persons. Hindi kailangan magkita-kita. All you have to do is impart your knowledge, which I know you are very rich in. Rich in. Ako naman, wala akong ituturo sa inyo. Ang, ang gusto ko lang sabihin, it's doable. It's doable. Huwag po tayo magpa-apekto sa new normal. It's doable. Yun lang po, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Salamat po. Thank you, Sir Ronald. That was Sir Ronald Eugenio from Rex Bookstore. Before we will proceed, may I request everyone to open your video for a photo opportunity. Please. Thank you. As of this time, we have 263 participants. Okay, this is for our documentation, Sir Rod. Yes, Marlies, we have six screens po. May, may anim tayo na screens. So keep on smiling na po kasi we did not know kung saan screen tayo. Okay, so I'll now make a screenshot. Yung iba hindi pa po ata nag-open ng video. Pag-turn on po ng video. Okay, na po, 
Okay, thank you, Sir Rod. That was Engineer Rodrigo Pangantihon, a junior, our education supervisor in charge for the IT program. This is now the time to learn more on what our noble teachers can do and share to all our participants here in this webinar. We will now know how amazing our academic experts are. As F. Chanel Jose has said, the influence of the teacher extends beyond the classroom, well into the future. I'm sure everybody will agree on that. To start with, the first speaker to talk on creative strategies for teaching student teachers in a flexible learning mode is a BS Education English graduated cum laude at the Philippine Normal University. Her Master of Arts in Teaching English Language and Doctor of Philosophy in Applied Linguistics at the La Salle University. Our first speaker has several publication, to name a few, Communication Apprehension and Oral uh, Communication Strategies of Individuals with Turret Syndrome, Working Papers in Language Education and Applied Linguistics in 2020, Content and Pedagogy for the Mother Tongue, a course module 2021, Manila Rex Publishing and a lot more. At the same time, one of the in-demand resource speakers in her field. At present, she is the high school principal of St. Scholastica's College, Manila High School, grade seven to 12. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome via virtual applause, our speaker, Dr. Joanna Marie Lim. Dr. Lim, take it away, ma'am. Morning. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Thank you for your generous introduction. Can you hear me, everyone? That's the usual greeting now. Can you hear me? Loud and clear? Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, let me share my screen first. Dr. Lisa, can we stop sharing? Are you the one sharing or it's from Rex? Yeah. And, and. Let me just forward check. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing the full screen now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to all our participants, to our officials from CHED Region 11, from uh, to our per our. Uh, our representatives from Rex, Sir Ronald, of course, Dr. Pawilin, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Jonna Marie Lim, just call me Miss Lim or Jonna, not a problem. So I'm in charge of sharing with you creative strategies for teaching student teachers in a flexible learning mode. I would like to begin first as to who am I really as a teacher, uh, as you're sharing today. As introduced by Ms. Lisa Early, Dr. Lisa Earlier, I'm a school administrator, specifically a high school administrator, and I hope this was the reason why I was asked to do this talk. I'm also a teacher. I teach in another university. Um, specifically, I'm handling grad school. Uh, most of the subjects that I handle are, handle are related to curriculum design uh, and language teaching in general. I do some research from time to time, and of course, I'm a proud module writer of Rex Publishing Incorporated. Let's go straight to the point. The mandate for TEIs right now is that we have to continue to strive to sufficiently prepare the next batch of teachers to teach in the post-pandemic in the new normal environment. And our courses, specifically um, the field study and the teaching practice, they are expected to be experiential. These were all taken out from the Joint Ched DepEd Memorandum Order issued this year. It must be experiential. They use, they must use the different new normal learning modalities, developmental through coaching and mentoring, and aligned with the learning continuity plan and the most essential learning competencies. Before I proceed to the meat of the presentation, um, I'll try to be very straightforward in my presentation because there are other presentations that would come after me. I would want to, I would want to present a disclaimer that 
the presentation that I prepared, it actually is coming from a perspective of a school administrator in charge of accepting teachers. We are the one hiring teachers. I'm not currently involved in any courses that, uh, that, that, uh, that train student teachers. I'm not even in a TEI. But what I will do is that I will work within the boundaries of my experience as an administrator and what we are expecting our applicants, new applicants for 2021, 2022. What are the competencies that we expect from them? And hopefully this will help you TEIs shape also as to how you will conduct your teacher training practices, your student teacher training, and even the courses related to student teacher training. Okay, so as a school administrator and as a school who hires teachers, the most important questions that we need to answer this at this time in this new normal is that what should or what do student teachers need to know and be able to do for them to successfully deliver lessons by means of flexible learning modalities? Uh, Every time we talk about the new normal, there are so many definitions to it. Others would call what we have right now as the new normal. Others would refer to the new normal as the post-pandemic time, meaning that will be the new normal. And the, 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 the time that we have right now is actually just a transition to the new normal. Whatever your definition of the new normal is, I'd leave it to you. But the most important thing is that um, we all agree that after this pandemic, we all know that it will really be a different, we have a different scenario, we'll have a different um, landscape already because this crisis has pushed us to our boundary, uh, to, to our limits. We really had, we, we had to find ways to rethink of how we do teacher education on how we deliver instruction. And at the same time, how, how we even assess our teachers, how we evaluate our teachers. So definitely there will be a new normal after this pandemic. So we have to prepare our teachers, especially our student teachers, in how they will be able to survive and, of course, thrive in post-pandemic era. So let's begin with the expectation. What is expected of teachers anyway? And I think this is something that we need to clarify. We need to be able to define as a, as a, as a linguist. Crucial for me that we always define discourses. In this case, we have to define to our teachers, especially to our student teachers, what is expected of them. And the best way to define it is to get definitions of the expectations from the teachers on the ground right now. Pre-COVID-19, uh, these are the basic expectations of a teacher. Of course, they are course writers, you know, they, they create um, uh, materials for the course, they're instructional designers, and they teach in the class. But at this time, COVID-19 and most likely even after COVID-19, the course writer, instructional designer, teacher um, responsibilities or functions are still there. But this time, they somehow we, we know, you feel it also, you've experienced it. We do take on roles of administrators because most of the time you are at home. So you have to manage also every, all the work that you have to do. You have to be editors of the modules that you create, of the learning materials that you create. You also become printers at times, dispatchers for some schools who, ha, who, who, who adopted, schools that have adopted um, printed modules, distribution of printed modules. And we know that the list goes on. I have here listed some of the expectations that are, these are new responsibilities that came in, uh, that came out during the COVID-19 era. Flexible learning, of course, there's an expectation that we are all familiar with how flexible learning as a pedag pedagogical approach works. I will not discuss this because I think um, Dr. Pawino is in charge of this part. Teachers must be, of course, familiar with the different delivery learning, the different delivery learning modalities. How will teachers create study guides, lesson plans, and of course the self-learning modules for our students? How will we how will our teachers design learning activities given the MELCs? How will teachers assess and how will they create learning materials? My presentation specifically today will focus on learning materials. Uh, there are so many expectations listed and I only have an hour for, for my presentation. Among all that I've listed, what we felt and what we've experienced as an institution, we need more training and 
what consumes most of teachers' time right now is the development of the learning materials themselves. We were not prepared for the migration to online, but we just have to accept the fact that we need to do something about it. And we need to make it work. And one of the most important um, areas of work that we had to give more time, really, and to give more attention to, is really working on developing um, learning materials. And whenever we talk about learning materials, let me see. We go back to the very question, why, how important are learning materials? Because at this, in this setup that we are in, in a distance learning setup, we always go back to the critical question of how do we guarantee that students are learning? Um, we have been hearing a lot of calls on academic freeze. And one of the reasons why there's a clamor for academic freeze is there are different opinions that would say that it's not working that our setup is not working. And their main, one of the main reasons or one of the main basis of why the distance learning setup is not working is because um, some students would claim that they're not learning at all. So this is the biggest challenge that we need to make our students, our future perspective, our future teachers, they need to understand that in a distance learning setup, there is a bigger challenge, there's a bigger question as to how do we guarantee student learning in this kind of setup. So we all know that in a distance learning setup, whatever your, modality, your flexible learning modality is, we make use of instructional materials in delivering our lessons. And for the more privileged institutions, we do have the technological tools available to us. But of course, for the less privileged, and we do have some students even in the privileged institutions who do not have the access to internet, do not have the tech tools or the gadgets. We make use of printed materials, specific uh, printed instructional materials to deliver instruction. That's why the focus of my presentation is on learning materials and how do we ensure that the learning materials that we provide to our students are of quality, they are varied, and most importantly, they are interactive. In the latter part of my presentation, I will show to you the importance of interactivity, which equates also to student engagement, and how it can actually translate into student learning. Um, we are at this time that we are all overwhelmed with the work that we do. So I would always remind my co-workers, even my friends in the academe, let's try to focus on the essential itself. Um, let's go back to the very reason why we're teaching, and that is students must learn. So I hope that's the, the, that's the perspective, um, that's the mindset that we are all in right now as we listen to my, my, my sharing. How do we make sure that our stu student teachers understand fully as to how students learn and how they guarantee that students are learning? So the key questions that we will answer here are these. What are learning materials? Where can we get them? How do we define and measure quality of learning materials? What does variety of learning materials mean? And how do we make our learning materials interactive? Latter part of the presentation, I'll show you some strategies also, additional strategies that you can use in training our student teachers. So go straight to question number one. I hope you don't mind. So just, Chat me if you have a question or if you think I'm going too fast. Uh, so the first question is, what are learning materials and where do we get them? I think this has to be very clear to everyone. Instructional materials, according to the University of Wisconsin-Madison in their uh, website, these are content or information conveyed within the course. This would include your lectures, your readings, your textbooks, your multimedia components, and other resources in a course. I would like to pick up what Sir Ronald sir said earlier. Um, some, some of us get to be overwhelmed with the work that we do right now. Yes, it is overwhelming at times because we feel that these are all new. But I would want you to think about it later on if you have extra time today. Think about it. Is it really new? The main difference that we have with the setup right now and what we had pre-COVID is that we don't have that face-to-face -face interaction with the students. Definitely, that's different. And that makes it, you know, that makes work more challenging for us. But in terms of how we are expected to do things in a distance learning setup, if we come to think of it, there's 
it's actually almost similar of what has been expected of us from the previous, uh, even the pre-COVID. Whenever we talk about student-centered teaching and learning, I, I would always tell this to my teachers that I, 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 I supervise, even before pre-COVID, whenever I observe their classes, there is still a tendency for teachers to think that their very role in the classroom is they're the source of information. So most of the time when you enter class, you'd see teachers do lectures, spend 30 minutes of the one hour contact time with their lectures. And I would always ask them, are there other ways that these lectures can be done not inside, not during the contact time, it can be given perhaps as part of the preparatory work of the student prior to coming into the class and make use of that contact time in processing what they have learned, the knowledge that they've constructed as they go through, as they digest the materials that you've provided to them prior to the class itself. And that comment, I usually give that comment prior to the pandemic. Now, if you come to think of it, that comment that I've been giving for quite some time already actually applies in this setup. And this is what is happening right now. We prepare all the learning materials. We have your video recordings. You have your readings. You give them all to the students and you ask them to do it asynchronously. And then when there's an opportunity already for you to have live classes with them, you don't give lectures anymore. Of course, sometimes there are some teachers who would still give lectures, depending on the nature, especially if it's a highly specialized subject. But then most of the time, especially if you're dealing with secondary students, you don't have to repeat what was said on the lecture, the recorded lecture. You spend your live classes this time processing what students have learned from those materials. And when we started preparing, uh, to be very honest, when we started preparing for for our classes for school year 2020, 2021. I know everyone was having difficulties with it, but at the back of my mind, I was telling myself, this crisis is actually pushing us to do what we have been expected to do for the past decades. Hindi natin ginagawa kasi ang dami natin ibang ginagawa. Pero ngayon, this, um, this setup is telling us, is pushing us, no, wala tayong choice, we really have to go student-centered. And every time you have doubts in what you're doing now, na parang hindi siya nag-work, parang baka hindi natututo yung bata. Of course, maganda na you, you still ask yourself, natututo ba talaga yung bata o hindi? Importante talaga din yun. Pero ang laging tanong natin dyan ay, kamusta ang mga binabalik na output ng mga studyante ninyo? Are they meeting your expectations? If they are, Please don't be too harsh on yourself. Don't say that they're not learning. You are actually giving them this time golden opportunities to learn on their own. And this is what learning is all about. The content that they learn from our classes, they will forget about it years from now. But skills like self, skills and dispositions on self-regulation and learner autonomy, these are skills that they will be able to transfer whatever they're job is eventually, whatever their position will be in the academy eventually, whatever their function will be in the academy eventually. So, dun po, kapitan po natin yun. At definitely, hindi po agad natin makikita ang resulta niya. But that's something that should not bother you, should not, what you call this, should not make you feel disheartened. Because we know that these are actually, uh, ang ginagawa natin ngayon, these are student learning, uh, uh, what we call it, strategies that we are employing because we were forced but by the distance learning setup. So I would want you to focus on how learning materials, going back to this definition, how learning materials were defined, that the best instructional materials are aligned with all the other elements in the course, including the learning objectives, the assessment and activities. And I would want you to think about this one, that every time you design instructional materials, it's not just for the sake that you, you get to submit something to your supervisor or there's something that students can do. That's what I would always say. Uh, uh, my, my, our, our mantra right now is that make sure that students, uh, we lessen our faculty meetings. Teachers should have more time working on the instructional materials. We should have a very robust, academic monitoring of the materials produced by the teachers, there should be levels of checking on those materials before it can be deployed to the students. Because we just have to accept that the learning materials that we provide to our students right now are taking the spotlight. 
students are interacting more with the learning materials compared to the teachers. And we cannot really insist that the teacher should interact more because we know that it's not possible. So whenever we talk about learning materials, uh, when we ask where can we get them, of course, there are three ways where you can get or three ways for you to develop learning materials. You can actually adopt learning materials. You can adapt your modify le existing learning materials. Or, or, of course, you can create your own learning materials. So I'll just... I'll just do a quick rundown po, uh, of the learning materials because I know that you have an idea already of what these are. Of course, very common are your printed materials. Your syllabus definitely is a learning material. Some teachers disregard syllabus as uh, outline lang yan. But um, especially in a distance learning setup where you have limitations with your interactions with your students, a well-constructed syllabus uh, with a clear progression of how one competency is developed down to the next. It's very important in guiding the students, in wiring students' minds as to how the course or how the subject will go about. Of course, your lesson files, your assignment files that you upload, the rubrics that you have, these are all, these can be online, or of course, you can have these in printed uh, forms. Your, ha your handouts or any published content, or the modules, for example, from Rex Publishing, that those are considered as printed materials. Um, digital media or recorded lectures are another source of printed material, uh, another source of materials, instructional materials. So you have these. Okay. You have your lecture notes as well. Okay. PowerPoint presentations or your Prezi presentations. Let me just show you. I'm not sure if I was able to. I think I was not able to click that. Let me see. Can you, hear the, can you hear the audio? Can you hear the audio? Parang hindi po ato. Nang yes, presentation po ma. Apo, can you hear the audio? No. Sa presentation po ninyo, Dr. Apo, Jonah. Yes. Hindi, yes. hindi po, Dr. Jonah. Here, here. Nawal, ha? Let me just go back. I'll just show you one example of I will not play the entire thing, but I'll show you one example of uh, a PowerPoint presentation um, with um, audio recorded explanation. I would want you to focus on how simple um, the presentation is. Uh, you've seen a lot of presentations from, especially for the, from the young teachers, they're using Adobe Premiere, etc. Please do not uh, do not force yourself to do those things if you are not yet ready because you will just stress out yourself. Here's one example of a presentation that I did for my class. Simply, simply lang siya. Uh, let me see ha kung mag-replay siya ng mind. In a while. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. We begin module three Can you by hear introducing it, basic Lisa? concepts of materials. Yes po. Okay. Narinig na po doc. Development is highly dependent on what we know as to how learners acquire a second language. Our instructional decisions as language teachers, what to teach and how to teach it, reflects our assumptions on how language is acquired and learned. This only shows that our discussion on materials development is firmly anchored on theories and okay. beliefs around Cognitive engagement no, I'll stop that one. can only be activated if we do. In a while. Okay. So that was just a, it was just a sneak peek of one of the materials that I developed for my class. It's not so tech savvy. It's very simple. But I just have my 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 rule would always be every time I send in or I upload uh, a presentation for my students, I have to make sure that it's highly intentional, meaning how I design it's very intentional. My objectives are very clear. It doesn't need to be long. Please do not dump too much materials to your students because it will not help them at all. Uh, responsibility now of teachers, and this is what you should train your student teachers also, is that how they should be able to filter um, sources, um, resources, how they would transform it into 
instructional materials that I ha that are highly purposeful or highly intentional to the learning goal for that particular what you call the session. Uh, this one I think is just around five minutes. Um, it's the usual time they say that is uh, what you call this that is healthy for students. Five minutes of presentation, um, even for readings. Um, before when, for example, when I teach graduate school students, I just give them um, a, a list of, for example, five articles to read. Now we have to be extra um, sensitive. Even if there are adult learners already, of course, there are some limitations also. There are a lot of factors that could affect their mental and physical well-being. That's why you also have to streamline. Uh, be more, what they call this, be more specific of what you want them to, to, have, to, to do and to work on. Para po, pag nakuha niyo po yung resulta, madali niyo rin po siyang makita at makita kung talagang natuto yung bata. So another... Another source of material, sorry, ha, is our expert interviews or guest recordings. Okay, so uh, because of the online setup, we have more opportunities this time to invite people to be in our classes. Okay, so these are materials. I think this is one of the most authentic materials that you can, what you call this, you can, you can utilize. So in my case, for example, when I was teaching curriculum design and materials development, I, I invited, um, what you call this, um, curriculum designers and te even teachers. These are some of the teachers. I invited them and they talked about their experience in the development of materials. Okay. Of course, another one is our student created content where you can, Allow your students to create um, student wikis, for example. I'm showing an example of a canvas um, in Canvas where I load it's in the, what do you call this? It's in the pages. Usually some of the, kahit ano pong LMS, yung minsan meron po yan. Um, for Google Classroom, they have something like that as well. So for Canvas, for example, we have the pages tool. And what we do is that you can upload the video. For example, this is your learning material. This is the input that you want your students to work on. Then you can just have what to call this, your instructions after. For example, you have the questions I have here. So in preparation for a sync session next Wednesday, watch the interview and then answer questions that follow. And then in this page, students can actually co-create content as to how they understood. Um, actually, it's not just a comprehension question. It's really co-creating knowledge, co-constructing knowledge about, in this case, teacher cognition. Okay, so you can do that. You have your open educational resources as uh, sources of your learning materials. So in your teacher trainings, this is something that you can include as well. Teach your student teachers on how to navigate open educational resources. So here's an example. I'm just showing it to you. This will also ensure that the sources, uh, the, the what do call this, the sources that they get their materials from are also reliable. Then, crucial that you teach our student teachers what to look for in adopting, adapting, or designing a material. So I have three. I mentioned three earlier: quality, um, variety, and interactivity. So uh, you, you've heard the news about this one. So the question that we need to answer here is that how do we define and measure quality of learning materials? I think I did. I did present quality um, to the uh, uh, Gen Ed group last time, but just going back to it, um, I'm using a different set ex of examples for the module. You ask yourself, in whenever you talk about quality, first you start with, do your learning materials clearly state the objectives of the lesson? Okay, so here you see an example of a module, uh, actually a lesson from a module on content and pedagogy, in the teaching of mother tongue. So here, very clear, at the end of the lesson, what are students expected to do or to know or to do? Okay, then the next question that you have to ask, did the material contain learning experiences that require students to construct their own knowledge? Remember, we, uh, the, 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 the very heart of student learning is that students should be able to construct their own knowledge from um, input that is provided to them, okay? Here, you see an example. Um, the second task, the first task, by the way, for this lesson is that students are asked to read through the stages of emergent writing and then match it to the illustration at the side, okay? Very simple lang siya because this is an activation um, 
activity, just to activate their knowledge about writing and the different stages of emergent writing to be specific. Then second task, students were asked to analyze this time different instructional activities. Um, mother tongue instruction is um, highlights two, the two track method, and that is the meaning track and the accuracy track. Now, whenever you teach mother tongue, you either focus on the meaning or the accuracy itself. So here, um, the activity asks students to analyze each activity provided. And then they have to identify or categorize if this activity targets the meaning track or the accuracy track. Okay, so here, first two, you're you're seeing already um what to call this? You're seeing how these um tasks can help students construct their own knowledge about writing as a macro skill, specifically in the mother tongue. Then. Come, comes in the third task where students are expected to abstract. This is where really the, co the construction of knowledge really comes in, where students are asked, given an instructional um, strategy, they have to have the mother tongue curriculum guide with them and identify which competencies were actually addressed by these instructional strategy. Remember the goal um, whenever you develop a lesson is that one of the most important things that you have to sure is that the competencies that you've set to be achieved by the students should be well aligned with the strategy or the learning experiences that you have decided to to what call this to include in your lesson so here we are testing whether the students can actually see that alignment napaka importante po nun eh, uh, um, as uh, what to call this as an academic supervisor of of 80 plus teachers that's what we always have to make sure na yung competencies nila na tinarget nila, tama ba siya, akma ba siya dun sa gagawin nila sa klase, sa sudyante. Okay? Bigyan ko kayo ng isang example, ang mm, usual na nagiging problema na, ng, ng mga skwelahan ngayon. Yung mga teachers, sobrang creative. Ah? Of course, maganda yung pagiging creative. But the creativity should not be too time consuming, should not consume too much time of the students, of the learning time. It should be it should not impede achievement of the learning goal. Halimbawa, um, I'm not sure if you, uh, if you still see this in, in, in assessments created by teachers. One of the assessments that I really hate the most is when teachers would ask, my identification, the type of exam is identification. So there are items, statements, and that would ask teach us, uh, students to identify what concept or what construct is being asked for. Instead of just writing down the correct answer, students are asked to look for the word in a word search box. Nakikita na, alala niyo po, ginagawa pa rin po yan ng ibang teachers. Na kung ang sagot, for example, ay sabihin natin, ang sagot ay writing. Let's just say writing yung sagot, tamang sagot. But instead of just writing, writing in the exam, what the students will have to do is to look for the word search box with a lot of the letters there, ahanapin pa nila yun. At ang lagi ko tanong doon is that, Anong competency ang minimeasure nyo using the word search box? And some teachers would always say, um, yes, kasi ano yan, students enjoy doing word searches. Yes, I do understand that students enjoy word searches, but we also have to accept the fact that it's not re even related to the competency that you're targeting, and it will just consume time. So this is the goal of, of this task. Kailangan alam ng isang teacher Exacto, kung aligned ba ang kanyang competency sa instructional strategy. So here, the task in the task, students were asked to compare their answers to their seatmate, and at the same time, um, ask about similarities and differences in the competencies that they have identified. Because there's a possibility that they would be able to identify the competencies, and they are still aligned to the competencies. And they're asked to discuss and agree with the seatmate. So I would want you to focus on how this task looks like and how it's defined as quality of tasks. And of course, whenever we talk about quality, you ask yourself, was the learning material designed to develop students' critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication skills? Do the activities and materials result in the student's acquisition and application of essential knowledge and skills? So for that lesson earlier on writing in the mother tongue, teaching writing in the mother tongue, the final task asked from the student is that they have to create, it's not really a lesson plan, but just one instructional activity, okay? So here, an activity title, lesson objectives are still being asked from them, but at the same time, they have to describe the activity. And crucial to highlight here is the criteria for grading. This is something that we'll always have to make sure the teachers would include. Kailangan malinaw yung criteria for grading. 
but because um we're teaching um B ed students here on how to teach mother uh, writing in the mother tongue, we would want them to do metacognition. Um, hindi dapat siya lang magdesign. Kailangan pag after magdesign ng learning material or ng in this case a learning activity, we would want them to think about to reflect on the learning activities that they've designed. So we ask questions like, are the learning ob objectives clearly defined? If not, what suggestions do you have to improve them? By the way, for these process questions, um, this will be done uh, in collaboration with another, with, with peers. So is the instructional activity well aligned with the learning objectives? Yeah, yung mga ganyan tanong. Okay. And of course, there's criteria for, uh, criteria for grading also for the instructional activity. Okay. So just a recap, whenever we talk about quality of learning materials, these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And these are the questions that our student teachers must be very um, well versed with, okay? The second one is variety itself in the learning materials that we create. So what does variety of learning materials mean? So here, for example, I have here the course description of one course, one subject. I, my, 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 my strategy is very simple. I start with the learning outcome. Uh, all of our, what call this, all of our, all, all program, all syllabus have learning outcomes anyway. So from the learning outcomes in this uh, syllabus, I only have three learning outcomes. But what I did is that prior to what to call this, prior to the start of the, the term or the semester, I already identify as to what learning materials will I be able to utilize for each learning outcome. Okay, so makikita niyan. Of course, there are some duplications. You really cannot, uh, you know, you cannot really go away with that one. But at least one way or the other, you're getting an idea as to how varied your learning materials are. Mahirap din naman kung puro printed materials lang the entire time for the entire SEM. Or mahirap din naman kung puro YouTube videos lang. Your students would actually notice that. And they would, uh, they would brand your class as the YouTube class or the readings class. Um, there's nothing really wrong with that kind of branding, but it, we know that it directly affects student engagement. Your students are interested in your subject if you cannot var uh, vary your learning materials. So ganyan. So this is, this is how my course looked like, one of the subjects that I taught. Get to vary new learning materials. Um, I didn't have what to call this. Yeah, I have I had case study ones now. This is the final learning outcome. So this is where it applied. Okay. Um, whenever we talk about variety of learning materials, my advice would always be do not overdo it. Uh, remember that what's important right now is that you achieve the learning goals, your learning goals for your classes. And this is something that we want our student teachers to understand as well. Especially our young, very young um, teachers. Your student teachers are young. They are digital natives. Um, they are, what do you call this? Ang uh, gagaling nila sa technology. Of course, we encourage them to make use of those technologies because most of the time, talagang they get students' interest in the use of those technologies. But we have to warn them as well to be very extra cautious in the use of those technologies that it might be too time consuming already it and it might impede learning itself kung sobrang dami niya. Um, in our case in, in Saints Co, um, it's our policy. Of course, we encourage our teachers to use different tech up tech apps. So when they submitted um uh, when they submitted their teaching guides um at the start of the term, they are expected to write there as well what apps or tools and tools will you be using for this kind of lesson? You know, I was very surprised when I saw it because I, I noticed that we had some teachers that for each lesson, parang merong apat o limang tech tools or tech apps, yung applications na gagamitin for just an hour class. And we had to return all of them and we had to rediscuss what is really essential. Sa dami ng gagamiting apps, ang tanong doon, gaano kadalas, gaano kadak kalaking oras yung kakainin sa bata sa kakalipat nila sa applications. Na in this, it will aid learning, it will actually be an additional obstacle to learning itself. So we had to set, um, we had to set limitations. You can vary it perhaps from time to time for each of your lesson, pero sana as much as possible in one lesson, huwag masyadong maraming switching of apps. It's too much for the students. And of course, uh, you, you, 
malaki ang chance talaga na mauubos lang yung oras niyo, kaka, kaka-reconnect dun sa bagong application. Remember, the goal is that as much as possible, if you can reduce live classes of students, the synchronous time, because of, you know, the fatigue of online learning, um, we do that one. Hindi na kailangan madagdag pa yun sa oras na mag-uubos sa inyo. And of course, for seasoned teachers like us, um, syempre hindi tayo ganun ka-tech savvy, um, let's try to be kind to ourselves also. Let's not put too much pressure on us. Let's ask ourselves um, among the technological tools and apps available and that we know of, ano yung pwede natin gawin at this point in time? And perhaps every other semester, every semester, we upgrade. We learn something new, kahit isa lang. We learn something new and we try to incorporate it in our classes. The third one is interactivity. So how do we make our learning materials interactive? And I would want you to focus on this one. I would want you to emphasize on this matter. Uh, I think you've heard this uh, from other webin from the other webinars that you've attended, that even before um, e even before uh, um, COVID era, the the COVID nineteen pandemic, we know that there are three types of interaction where students can actually learn. When student interacts with content, and this is through your learning materials, right? And you you have learning materials prior to COVID nineteen. Students can learn through these learning materials. Of course, students can learn from the teacher, and students can learn from one another. Peer, um, peer work, collaborations with students, of course, learning can take place in all these types of interaction. Please take note that learner is not passively, whenever we, what to call this, whenever we want, whenever we talk about interactivity, we would want to highlight that learner is actually not passively going through and trying to sip in the content. But it means that they have to solve problems, make decisions, look for pieces of information, test assumptions, and take risks. Now, the question is, everything that I've listed here in yellow, can this be done through your learning materials? Of course. When you give out readings to your students, you don't just simply ask them to read without any direction as to what they're supposed to do with that reading. So for, for your learning materials to be interactive, provide opportunities where students will solve problems, will make decisions, will look for pieces of information, where they will test their assumptions and even take risks. So how do we interact, um, to make it, to, to, to put it simply, how do we allow learners to interact with the materials? And if we can be successful in making our learners interacting with these materials, we can guarantee that students are actually learning. So you ask yourself, do you ask questions frequently? Do you give learners space in the materials in which to write their answers? Do you ask them to pause and reflect on their own experience? Do you give them opportunities to practice the skill that they're being taught? Do you ask them to recall what they've recently worked through? Or do you suggest they talk with someone about an issue that has been raised, for example, with a colleague, a family member, or their tutor? If you have yes and as an answer to these questions, you're actually allowing your learners to interact with the materials. But how can we make our materials interactive using tech tools? I didn't discuss anymore that your interaction with the peers and the teacher because we, we, we are well aware of that one. But how do, we, how do we make our materials, our materials more interactive this time using tech tools? Of course, you, you may have heard of this one. Some of you may have been using it. Um, for me specifically, the Google productivity apps have been very useful. I will share with you some of what to call this, some of the strategies. Perhaps I'll just show one video, all the others, I'll just show you the, the, the what to call this, the title of the strategy and you can just perhaps check it on YouTube so to save time. But I would want to show this one because this is one of um, strategy that I frequently use in my class and I find it very effective. Hey everybody, Dominic here, and uh, I want to talk to you about Hypothesis, uh, which is a collaborative annotation tool. Now, I think we all know what annotations are. Uh, we can highlight text in a web page or an article and leave some notes on the sidebar. Uh, well, Hypothesis allows us to do this in a collaborative way, which means that when I go to leave uh, annotations, I can actually see the other annotations that other people have left, and I can even uh, comment 
comment on their annotations, give them feedback, maybe answer their questions. Um, now, Hypothesis is a tool that's actually built into Canvas, and we actually have it available across all People of CVTC. to annotate over time. Now, really I can include um, so right a URL, in my so if I have a website, so for example, here is a and in the uh, Wikipedia article on Bitcoin, I can actually copy that URL, click on the find button, go back to Canvas, scroll down click on until I enter find URL, hypothesis, paste right it there. in, I'll click on that, and hit submit, and it's I'll scroll me, down to the bottom, hit select. Uh, what web page or scroll document down to the bottom. do I want people to annotate over top of? Now, I can include a URL. So if I have a website, so for example, here is a uh, Wikipedia article on Bitcoin. I can actually copy that URL, go back to Canvas, click on enter URL, paste it in, and hit submit. Okay, I'll scroll down to the bottom, hit select, and then I'll scroll down to the bottom here, and click on Save and Publish. And you'll see that now the Wikipedia article is actually embedded into my Canvas assignment. And over here on the right is the Hypothesis sidebar. I can click on this little arrow here if I want to hide it and see more of the article. But here's where the magic really happens. As I'm going through this article, I can actually highlight some text. And when I do so, you'll see a little pop-up that says Annotate. I click on Annotate, and then I can actually leave a text comment here. And when I'm done, click on Post. And this leaves that annotation on the document. Now, if someone else comes into this assignment, they're going to see my annotation, and they can even reply to it. So here I am logged in as another student, and you can see that over here on the right-hand side, I can see the comment that someone left. I can even click on that comment, and that will jump me down to that part of the page. Then I can click on the Reply button and give a reply to that person and click on post. I should mention that your replies can also include hyperlinks or even images if you so desire. Now, if you are using Hypothesis as an assignment, you can actually use SpeedGrader to see the annotations that students have left. So I can click on SpeedGrader up here in the top right as an instructor. And just like normal in the top right, I can cycle through different students. But over here, I can see the hypothesis window, and I can see all of the comments that the particular student I'm looking at right now has left. I can click on that comment, and it will jump me down to that part of the web page. I could then enter in a grade right here, leave any comments that are private to just the student if I wanted to. I could even reply to the student in hypothesis right here if I wanted to as well. Click on submit, and that grade is recorded. Now, I just showed you how you can use Hypothesis to put web pages into your Canvas course, but you can actually also pull in PDFs from your Google Drive. I'll also mention that Hypothesis doesn't have to be an assignment in your course. It could be an ungraded activity. If you want to do that, in the module, I can click on the plus symbol. In the drop down here, I'll select our tool. And now, the same thing I did before, I'll locate Hypothesis, click on that. And now, this time, instead of selecting a web page, I'm actually going to select a PDF from my Google Drive. So I'll click on this. I'll select the PDF that I want and hit select. I can give this page a different name. And then I'll click on Add Item. Now I can click on this page that I just created, and you will see that Hypothesis is now wrapped around this page as well. Whether it's a PDF from my Google Drive or a web page that you can access online, either way, you and your students can be doing annotations collaboratively together using Hypothesis. So, like I said, this is a tool that's available to all faculty okay. in uh, C... Sorry, so that's one. Hey, Another way of making your um, learning materials more interactive, of course, is the, the use of the discussion forum, very similar to active reading by annotation, but this one, I, I think it's more accessible to everyone. So... Uh, here is one example, but of course, make sure that you have a certain structure when you do discussion forums, and that has to be clear to your students. Let's let's watch this one. Um, among the videos that I've seen, this is what I've been using in my class for discussion forum. Hello, this is Professor Bustini Bruth. In this video tutorial, I'll walk you through how to and reply in the Canvas discussions. All right, so we'll go ahead and find an assignment. You can do that by going to the to-do list. And if it's not listed there, you go to modules and scroll to the assignment. And in this case, I'll go to week three and look for the Canvas discussion that's due in week three as our example. 
in this case, Canvas Discussion, Business Good, or Public, public Good. You'll click that, and then the assignment will appear along with, you know, in, information like why we're doing it, what kinds of skills and knowledge you'll be learning, which are typically listed in the overview for the week, and then a list of the steps. And so uh, first, of course, you want to read all of the directions. You'll want to note the deadline. And then typically uh, the number three steps will be, you know, an articulation of how to apply the, the steps. And this is basically what I'm showing you in the video today. So in, in this case, copy and bold each discussion question, and then you'll reply thoughtfully in each turn using the concepts and principles that you've learned from the book. And you'll want to follow this, the steps closely because the rubric assigns points on your ability to have followed the, question, the guidelines uh, closely. And so here's an example of what it would look like if you were to have done that what, you know, correctly. So this is the post that has been copy, pasted, and bolded. It is then followed by a little space there. And then the answer, a substantive answer using concepts and principles to demonstrate your understanding. And then followed by the next prompt, also bolded, and then with the reply beneath it. And the reason why we bold that is so that it can be differentiated from the reply. It's just easier on the eye. It also looks more professional. So in this case, here are the uh, discussion questions, right? So you'll, you will highlight that on, the, on your mouse or your equivalent. It's a right click, copy, right? This is after you've read chapter two and three, by the way. And then you will go ahead and reply right here. This button that says reply. And, uh, and then you right click on your mouse or the equivalent and paste. Go ahead and do enter, you know, and you will, will type your answer below, so on. And then you'll want to, of course, bold that, right? And here's a bold option. And then you'll go back up and say, okay, I'm done with that question. You will also copy that one. You will then paste it here and you will bold it, right? I typically don't bold until I pad the line underneath so that I don't bold the answer as well. So you will, you know, type your answer here as well. And you'll just, you know, do that until you've done. Once you are done, you will then post the reply and it will appear at the bottom of the last person who has you know, responded, and I won't scroll all the way up because this is an actual answer from a student. And, you know, yours will appear there and you're like, okay, I need to reply now because that's the second step. I need to peer reply now and I need three of them. And you will scroll this thing up and down to see what your choices are and you'll pick and choose, right? And then you have until Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. to get that completed. And you will basically do similarly what, you know, as far as formatting is concerned. You will pick a, uh, uh, a part of a student quote, say this one, and you'll want to reply to them. you want to put that in quotes, right? And then, uh, then you'll say, hi, and I'll just pretend this person is Robert. I, I don't know who this person is. I just completely made it up. And then you will type your reflection, thoughts, against their quote above. Now you'll write that. And you'll want to use principles and uh, concepts that you learn from the book as well. You know, the, the degree to which you agree or disagree or offer a different way to think about what that person has said. And, you know, it's best to also bold that so that it's differentiated from your answer. Okay, so... Hello. Okay. So... We are expected, by the way, if you're not using a canvas, of course, we're not expected to use one. What about this LMS? What I would want you to take, uh, take away from that video is that whenever you decide that you're going to use discussion forum as your, uh, what about this, as your strategy in interacting with your students, make sure that you have clear guidelines on how you go about it and that you get to see, um, you really get to interact be it synchronously or asynchronously with your students, um, the, the system that you get to create in interacting with them through the discussion forum must be very clear to everyone. Para po hindi masaya naman din yung, yung, what do you call this, yung, yung, yung opportunity to learn from one another. 
So usually in your discussion forums, please focus on core concept questions. Avoid yes or no questions. Wag po ganon. Um, dapat yung uh, it should have opportunity. Students should have opportunities to elaborate, to question, uh, to add more input to the discussion. So here are some examples of core concept questions that you can actually ask. Uh, there's also you can also use a three-part post strategy in uh, in your discussion forum where you ask your student, for example, what do they think about um, an issue, uh, perhaps, or ask them to state why they think what they think and state what they wish to know or what the problem or cha challenge will follow or result from the original question. So here are some of the, uh, what do you call this? this? This is another way of going through the discussion forum. And of course, um, I told you early, earlier, you have to be very clear as to how you go about the discussion forum and to make sure that students participate. Of course, it may be ungraded, but you can also take that opportunity to grade your students' uh, discussion forum postings because this, um, the discussion forum is our way as well of knowing if first, they went through the material that you've provided, second, if they actually learned something from the material, and at the same time, you would want to see as to how they are um, constructing their own knowledge from the materials provided to them. So that's one example. I'm just showing you snippets of this one. Of course, these are all available when you search them on the internet. So I would want to highlight here that every time we talk about interactivity, it actually means engagement. And definitely it would translate to student learning. One of the issues that, um, that, are, uh, that is constantly raised right now is the problem, um, it's a concern of teachers of students becoming less and less engaged in the online, specifically in the online setup. Lagi siguro na experience siguro yan, parang feeling nyo hindi ganun ka-engage yung mga bata. Um, even some students would say, oh nga miss, parang hindi ganun ka-participative yung mga classmates namin ngayon. But Perhaps there's some a grain of truth to it, but when I ask um, teachers, even I, I experience it personally, we always come up with the idea that students are less engaged right now because um, when we do class discussions during live classes, parang hirap nila pagsalitain, parang it's so difficult to ask them to unmute and then discuss their thoughts or share their thoughts to us. Perhaps it's true that they're not so um, what call keen into sharing their thoughts during the live classes, but it's also the time for us to rethink as to what student engagement would mean. Yes, um, students participating um, in a live class, in the oral discussion or class discussion in the live class is student engagement, definitely. It's a concrete way of um, knowing if students are engaged. But student engagement can also be redefined in the new setup, right? When your students can actually work on, on answer the learning materials, the instructional materials that you've given, the formative assessments that you've provided, if they can successfully work on it, if they work on it and successfully complete it, that's student engagement, right? When your students ask questions about the learning materials or the tasks that you provide to them, that is student engagement. When your students would chat you privately in the chat box, that is still student engagement. So uh, we just have to be, um, we, uh, what we are expected to do really right now is that we do our best to think outside of the box. Let's not think that everything that's happening in the face-to-face -face class must have its uh, corresponding, what do you call this? Um, it, must, oh, it must have a direct, what do you call this? Similarity or direct practice. It's similar to the face-to-face -face instruction. We know it doesn't work that way. We just simply have to reimagine as to how student learning is actually measured right now. In this case, student engagement, we need to redefine what student engagement is. And from there, perhaps we get to see whether students really are learning or not. And uh, you know, my, my basic response would always be, every time my teachers would say, ah, my students are not engaged, and I would always ask them, well, were they able to fulfill successfully the task? Pag nagawa nilang maayos yun, don't be too harsh on yourself. That's still student engagement, okay? So, Last part, some strategies that perhaps you can use. So uh, please, um, let's tr train our student teachers to make sure that when what about this? When they prepare for classes, we make the expectations explicit. So here, 
because we, most of us are doing modular approach already to instruction, I would really suggest that you adopt this one where you present a graphical overview of the course at the start of the, the, the semester or the term. So in my case, for example, this is one, from one of my courses, I, uh, I presented the, the subject in a way that it's divided into three uh, modules. For each module, I clarified already early on what were the targets. So for module one, they have to do a curriculum analysis. In module two, they have to develop a syllabus. In module three, an instructional module. And then from there, an overview of what are the important topics that we will cover. All of these, for example, um, stages of syllabus design, selecting a syllabus framework, parts of syllabus, all the tasks provided in each of these topics are all contributory for them to be able to create the language syllabus. So I had to make sure that all tasks were interrelated and that they help build the module final requirements so that um, the work is more streamlined to the students. And at the same time, students are more directed towards the, the learning, in this case, them developing a language syllabus. So that's one strategy that you can use. So here, makikita mo na, early on pa lang, kita na ng bata kung anong mga submissions nila. Second strategy is that, of course, we have to choose our materials and our strategies per post for you. Um, earlier, I talked about quality, variety, and interactivity as um, key characteristics in choosing, learning, choosing and designing learning materials. But when you decide what learning material or strategy should you use in your classes, crucial that you clarify it your, to yourself first. What is it you want to achieve first with your students? If you want them to collaborate, discuss, and compose, of course, these are some strategies that you can use. If you want them to provide a carefully argued analysis, you can ask them to listen to lectures. Uh, this, is, this is something that we have been doing even before the pandemic, right? But this time, we are highlighting that we really go back to how we, the fundamental principles of how instruction should take place and how preparation to instruction and how instruction should take place. So here, if you want students to answer questions about the topic, baka pwede ito yung mga ipagawa mo. So in deciding for a material or even a strategy that you're going to use, just make sure that, that, that your decision is driven by the purpose itself of why you're using this strategy or material. Another strategy, of course, especially in a distance learning setup, is that we have to create more opportunities for dialogue. Okay, so here are some examples. You can do a live Q&A with students using Google Doc. Actually, you can do this synchronously or asynchronously. So Google Doc, you know that we can co-collaborate with our students here. So pwedeng andun yung, you have a prompt question there. Pwede mo siyang gamitin to those who are not using an LMS. Um, wala ba, uh, wala kayong LMS. You can use um, Google Productivity Apps. They're all free anyway. So pwede doon, lagay ka ng question and then, you tell your students, yes, during our class period, I want you all to log into the Google Doc, um, access the Google Doc, and then let's discuss there. Okay? Ang pinakamaganda doon, nakikita rin ng iba yung sagot ng ibang kaklase nila. Another one is um, in, in creating opportunities for dialogue, um, I think very crucial yung tinatawag natin wait time. We know what wait time is in um, the art of questioning, right? It becomes more um, prominent right now, given that... Uh, Typically, what happens in the classroom is that in the live classes, teachers would say, uh, okay, they still have questions on what you're supposed to do. Kasi mag-asynchronous yung mga bata. They have questions on what you're supposed to do. Wala namang tanong. O di sasara na yung teacher in live class. And then it ends there. And then later on, you'd see so many questions, so many complaints. Uh, we didn't understand it. The teacher did not explain it properly, etc. And then the teacher would defend herself or himself. I gave you, I asked you. If you had questions, you didn't ask. But of course, we have to, uh, even in the art of questioning, we know we have to give away time to our students to really process, especially if there are tasks that they need to complete. So what we do typically is that, for example, right after instructions for the tasks are given, you instruct your students, if they do not have questions anymore, they can leave the class after they have perused the task. But they have to skim through it before you ask them to leave your classes. And then you ask them, if you don't have questions anymore, you may leave. But I will stay here for five or ten more minutes. I would want you, if you can try out the tasks, I would wait for you. And perhaps you might have questions for me. 
this would really apply specifically ano ha? this would this actually ha, has worked for especially for for young learners antayin mo talaga sila na ma, ma, matanong nila lahat bago ka magsara ng live classes mo of course an, another great way um great opportunity for dialogue is to use breakout rooms for your students you group them together and allow them to talk and then from time to time just visit their breakout rooms Another strategy, and I think most important, actually I really wanted, I was torn in, on working on learning materials or on the substan substantive feedback. Um, in one university that I'm affiliated in, when they were discussing as to how to do the teaching practice, the practice teaching of, of students, um, I, 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 was, I was sharing to them that in the scenario that we have right now, one of the most important skills the teachers or competency the teachers should have is their ability to provide substantive, um, of course, regular sub substantive and effective feedback to students. Because this is where instruction instruction and learning on the end of the students is really taking place. If the teacher can provide a very specific uh, on-point feedback to the work of the students. Uh, that's why we, we you experience this one. Ang isa sa pinakamalaking trabaho ngayon sa atin ay yung checkables natin. Bakit? Kasi nga, even if they do have collaborative submissions, may mga collaborative work pa rin, but this time, maraming tasks kasi tayo pinapagawa, so we are expected to not just simply give a grade, a random grade to that one. Qualitative feedback becomes more important this time to compensate for our lack of face-to-face -face classes. Personally, I'm the kind of teacher who believes in oral feedback as one of the most effective means. Yung Pagkabigay ng bata, yes, I give grade, I give um, some comments and uh, uh, write, uh, I'll write some comments on the work. But whenever I give it back to my students, I would really give, uh, I will really always take an opportunity to give oral feedback to them because it has worked for me for so many years. It can be a general oral feedback for the class or it can be a very specific oral feedback to a student. And of course, we do have limitations on oral feedback right now kasi nga, hindi naman lahat talaga may internet connection. That's why, Mas crucial ngayon yung ability ng teacher to give um, very comprehensive and at the same time on point um, substantive feedback to written feedback to our students' work. And of course, provide structured help sessions. Okay, um, If you have the, 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 the resources to do uh, live um, consultations, please do so. If not, Kahit chat naman, we have FB-based instruction um, used by DepEd. And I think one way or the other, it may work. It can actually work if we really just put our, you know, we, 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 we make sure that it's more it's systematic. Um, it's uh, what we call this, the, 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 the use of uh, providing um, the sessions is structured and at the same time, regular din yung pagbibigay natin ng sessions. I'd like to end my presentation with this uh, quote, less is more. Uh, we most of you have, are done with the semester or per, perhaps your term. We have learned so much from the past few months. But one thing that this crisis has taught us is that we hindi kailangan bongga lagi. Lalo na ngayon that well-being, everyone's well-being is is of uh, is our priority. We just have to make sure that the the very fundamental um, principle, the very fundamental goal of any teacher, and that is students should learn, is achieve. So let's not put too much pressure on ourselves. Let's focus that there, most of the time, especially in teaching and learning, less is actually more for us. So maraming salamat po. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Jonah, for discussing to us clearly and comprehensively creative strategies for teaching student teachers and flexible learning mode. With this, for sure, the participants have known what student teachers need to know and be able to know. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Jonah Marilim. Please give her a virtual applause. Thank you, ma'am. We would like to inform everyone that the open forum will be conducted after the three speakers have finished spoken with their topics. However, Dr. John has also another schedule to meet. If it's all right to ask you, ma'am, I ask your email ad, email ad for them to send their questions. I'll try to come back. I'll try to come back. I'll try to come back. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. 
Now let's proceed to our second speaker. To talk on the evolution of pedagogy and teacher education at a period of COVID-19 pandemic is a graduate of Bachelor of Elementary Education at the Philippine Christian University, Manila, a Master of Arts in Education, major in Curriculum Studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Master of Education, major in Curriculum Development in Science Education with the general weighted average of 1.0 at Iheim University, Matsuyama City, Japan, and a Doctor of Philosophy and Education, major in Curriculum Studies with a general weighted average of 1.03 at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Our second speaker has several research and publications, to name one, in the higher education books, Science, Technology, and Society 2017, Rex Publishing House, and refereed journals as well. To name one, comparing kindergarten admission policies of Eheim University, attached kindergarten school, and the University of the Philippines Integrated School. Uh, in Harris Journal of Education in 2015, and many others. Our speaker also presented several papers in international and national conferences, and in-demand resource speaker, and a former member of the Commission on Higher Education Technical Committee on Educational Leadership and Foundations. At present, he is the Associate Professor too of the College of Human Ecology and the Graduate School University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome by virtual applause our second speaker, Dr. Greg Tabios Pawilen, sir. Hello, good afternoon. Good morning, Paul. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am Lisa, for that very kind introduction. First of all, I would like to say I'm very sorry we had a problem with our internet connection at the University of the Philippines here in Los Banos yesterday, so I wasn't able to join you. I tried my best. In fact, until now, we still have we still don't have any internet. It's raining here, so I, but I, I went out and, and go to a different college, hoping that there is an internet, and luckily we have an internet here. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chedro, for the for in, for inviting me to be part of this uh, activity, and it's nice to be with my co uh, colleagues in the academy, Dr. Jonah. Jonah, congratulations, and uh, of course later on, Miss Tina. Miss Tina is has just celebrated her birthday. Tina binulgar ko na, sorry. Okay, uh, the other day. So anyway, maramagandang umaga po sa inyong lahat to the regional director, to the office of the Commission on Higher Education. Uh, of the region, uh, to all uh, deans, department chairs, and professors who are here, instructors who are here, magandang hapon po. Naimpag na malim yung amin. Aldaw yung amin, kakapsan. That's my greetings to you in Ilocano. Okay, so I will please allow me to share my screen. Okay, there. Okay. So my, I'm, I'm going to do it quick, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll entertain your questions for discussion later on. So the topic that was given to me is uh, it's entitled Evolution of Pedagogy and Future Education at the Period of COVID-19 Pandemic. So this is uh, our main point of discussion for this morning. So I'd like to start by saying that teacher education must evolve. Yes. There are already a lot of things that has, that has changed in our education system, in our society, and therefore we need to do something. We need to innovate, constantly innovate. We need to think of new ways on how to improve teacher education, especially at this period of COVID-19 pandemic. We need to uh, seek better ways in, in responding to the needs of uh, a group of learners, what we, know, what we call the millennial learners. So teacher education must evolve and we must go beyond the concept of educating teachers for pedagogical purposes. Okay, and I'd like to mention some educational drivers, okay, that we need to think about. I always mention this every time I give a lecture in education because it seems, okay, that we in the field of education forgot, okay, on how, what these educational drivers are and how we should do something. Okay, to respond to these educational drivers. 
First is the K-12 education. Yes, until now, the K-12 remains a challenge to all of us. Now, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the K-12 is changing its course and it's changing its, its forms. Okay, form. So, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, K-12 education must also evolve and it's, it's now evolving. Now we have the milk, the milk which is a problem to many education institutions, a milk that, is, that has caused a lot of problem, okay, to some schools. Okay, especially in basic education. And we have problems with modules, modules that are more problematic, modules that are not helping the students, but modules that are adding confusions and modules that are adding uh, more problems and issues in basic education. K-12 must evolve because this is our promise to the Filipino people, making our educational system more relevant and responsive to the needs of the people, promising them poor exit outcomes, and ensuring that the K-12 education is really global in perspective, highlighting the works of Filipino educators. Okay, the ASEAN education framework is also something that, that is uh, pushing us to make education or teacher education more relevant and responsive. Now, if you take a look at UNESCO's or ASEAN, I mean, ASEAN framework of education, you can see that diversity is something, or cultural, cultural diversity, ASEAN history, ASEAN culture, okay, uh, is, are, are now part of what we call the teacher education curriculum. Preparing ASEAN teachers are now, or is now, part of our task as educators, as member of the teacher education family. Okay, brain-based education research is also another driver giving us ideas that our learners in the 21st century are quite different from the kind of learners that we are, okay, when we were still, stu we are still students, okay. Brain-based education is telling us that there is no more such thing as right and left brain, that the brain is an integrated processor of learning and that knowledge should not be fragmented, education must be learner-centered, tertiary education, basic education, vocational technology, technical education must evolve, okay? And therefore, teacher, teachers must also be, or teacher education must be redesigned and teachers must be reoriented about the teaching profession. Brain-based education is making us now think that the pedagogy that we used to read, the pedagogy that we, we read in books are no longer the most relevant pedagogy that we need that, that we need at this point, especially now we have the pandemic. Now we can see that there are there is no such thing as pedagogy of compassion. But it is compassion that we all need now. And it is compassion that is lacking in what we do in implementing flexible learning and in implementing remote learning in all the things that we do in education. There is no such thing as pedagogy of love. Okay, yes, I understand that was a term used by Paolo Freire. After pedagogy of freedom, pedagogy of press, pedagogy of hope, and then the last is pedagogy of freedom. But we do not have a Filipino framework of pedagogy. So brain-based education is helping us think and rethink of the nature of our learners, think and rethink of the nature of our education system in relation to how the, we Filipinos think and behave, okay, how our brain processes information. Okay, international, in, in, internationalization is also one of the drivers. We need to internationalize our education system. At the period where outcomes-based education is implemented, where standards-based education is the name of the game, we need to make sure that all our standards, curriculum standards, competencies, content standards, everything, even our educational standards must be a par with international uh, international standards. This is the right thing to do. We are doing it not because we want to be number one. We are doing this not because we want Philippine education to be at par with the United States in all the developing countries, but we are doing this because this is the right thing to do. Okay, the fourth industrial revolution or fire. Okay, fire is the greatest invention of uh, that leads to of human of human beings that leads to the development of science and technology. Okay, if you see the history of science, you, you see that fire is the um, an important element that has changed, that has revolutionized. Okay, our ways of doing things in the past.
Okay, now, fire at, in our context is fourth industrial revolution. It's no longer, hindi ito na yung apoy. Pero yung apoy, yun, yun, yun. That's the most important uh, invention of human beings that has revolutionized everything. But now, the fourth industrial revolution is also changing the things that we do. The fourth industrial revolution is, is, is trying to, to automize everything, digitalize everything that we do in education, in business, and in all aspects of life. The fourth industrial revolution is asking us now, educators, to make learning more flexible, okay, and curriculum to be flexible because the students are different. And the students, of course, are, are non-traditional students, okay? The non-traditional students, we're not, we're not just dealing here about the millennial students, okay? The millennial students are just part of the, the, the total population of students that we must serve. We have non-traditional students too. Teacher education must, all, must not just prepare teachers who will teach from K to 12, but teacher education must prepare student, students who will also teach adults, okay? Who will also teach uh, out, school, out of school use, the ALS. And teacher education must be from womb to tomb, okay? Or up to the second, second life, probably, okay? So there are social challenges and demands that we must uh, respond, that we must think, okay? Social challenges that, that demands all teacher education institution to reshape their programs, to rethink of their curriculum, to reshape their the nature of their pedagogy and innovate. Okay, flexible learning challenge. Now it's a fourth industrial revolution. Now that we have the, the COVID-19 pandemic, flexible learning is the name of the game. Okay, we encountered a lot of challenges. We are encountering a lot of issues, a lot of problems. You know, I think the main reason why we have these problems is because of our lack of understanding of what flexible learning is and because we, 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 we of our lack of understanding of the needs of our learners. Okay. Ngayong panahon ng pandemic, ang pinag-uusapan natin kung minsan, kumusta yung ating mga estudante? Kumusta yung ating mga modules? Pero, I think we also ask ourselves, kumusta naman ako? Kumusta naman kaya yung mga co-teachers ko? Okay ba sila? Okay ba ang pagtuturo nila? Kung kino kumusta natin, yung mga estudante natin, kumusta yung mga estudante natin? Yung mga colleagues kaya natin, okay din ba sila? Kumusta rin ang ating mga pamilya? Okay, so those are the flexible learning challenges. We are thinking of pedagogy, but the challenge of flexible learning is more than pedagogy. The, the, the real challenges are the mental health challenges that we experience, okay? The socioeconomic issues, okay? The economic re recession that we, that we are in now, that we are experiencing now, okay? And of course, the ecological challenges that we are experiencing. We are experiencing natural disasters. We are experiencing political disasters. We see fake news in in, in Facebook, we hear a lot of uh, political uh, issues in, on, in television. So these are all disruptions in the eco eco ecology of our educational system. So teacher education is the, a field that should first respond okay, to these challenges. Okay, of course, we cannot do it alone. But teacher education, since we are task to develop teachers and these teachers will soon shape the minds and the conscience of the students, the future leaders of our generation, then I think, okay, we need to, we, we, we need to rethink again and again, okay, on how to make teacher education more relevant and responsive to our, to our people, more Filipino in character, okay, or more ethnic in terms of origin more relevant, responsive to our students. Okay, there are also challenges, okay, several challenges in the field of education in itself. Today we are talking about COVID-19, okay, but there are also other issues related to relevance, quality, and access that somehow also may trigger or is the, the problems or issues that we encounter or that we are encountering because of the COVID-19. One. 
relation to access, we need to address the digital divide. Teachers and teacher education professors must address the digital device, divide and encourage informed people, higher education institutions, and administrators not to romanticize the situation. Okay, not to romanticize situation, the situation. Why? Because there are many educators, there are many administrators who pretend that everything is okay. The answer is no, not everything is okay. Of course, we are in a problem no, and we are in, still in, such a, in, in a mess situation. We are still in a messy situation. We are still experiencing a lot of issues, troubles in responding to the needs of our learners. Are we giving up? The answer is no. We are the first, okay, we, we are the, we are, in fact, we are supposed to be the, 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 the most resilient among the, the different fields and disciplines in higher education. Why? Because teaching and learning are part of our mission. These are not our jobs. If you consider this as your jobs, then you don't have the right to stay in the teaching profession. I urge you to resign and retire now. Okay. But if you see these things as mission, if you see these things as part of our noble task, our sacred commission, okay, to teach and touch the lives of their students, then we need not to, we should not romanticize the situation where we are in. In order to develop a pedagogy, a module that is relevant and responsive to the, our learners at this period of suffering, we must see the reality. And, and from these realities of life, from these problems, we must do our best to solve the, the, the problem. Of course, we cannot change everything at a snap of a finger. But at least at the end of the day, you can be proud of yourself and say, I did my best anyway. The digital divide is a problem. Okay, internet connectivity is a problem. If you ask a student if he or she has a connection with internet, of course they will say, they will tell you yes. But how many children, how many students, how many, how many siblings do they have at home using that that minimum that data internet that Wi-Fi or mobile data that they are using? Okay, ilan bang computer sa bahay ng mga yan? So, survey, survey sa higher ed. Do you have computer? Oh, may computer daw. Siyempre, sasagot ng bata, yes. How many are they using what that computer? How many computers are there in their homes? Baka yun pa, gamit ng nanay, ng tatay sa nagtatrabaho. And if they have basic education uh, siblings o yung may ibang students din, gagamit din sila. Okay, so we cannot assume that everyone is okay. Of course, not everyone is okay. Okay, and from there, from accepting the fact that not everyone is okay at this period of pandemic, we must move forward together, okay, with compassion and with love, okay, to our students. But first, before you love your students, you have to love yourself because you cannot give what you don't have, okay? That's the problem because we need to, we are always pretending that everything can be solved by pedagogy alone. Pedagogy cannot bring the magic of teaching and learning unless, okay, unless the teachers, Okay, realize the roles, realize the important personal touch of teaching and learning. It's not the pedagogy that brings the magic, my dear friends. It's you, it's me, it's all of us in the teaching profession making a difference in the lives of our students. We need to bring, we need to bring the educational services to where the students are. That is the essence of flexible learning and remote learning. We should show compassion to our students. We must communicate our concern to our students. Sometimes it, at this period of pandemic, sometimes it's better to say, Kumusta ka na anak? Kumusta na ang bahay ninyo? Than to say, please submit your requirements on time. Sometimes it's better to say, hello, I hope you are okay. I'm praying for you. Than to, to, to email to the students a lot of readings. Okay, minsan ang dami nating ibinibigay na reading sa estudyante. My first question is, are we reading all those readings? Oh, we have just we have just compiled and send this to the students to read. Okay, that's unfair to students. Okay, a curriculum, curriculum compassion should be fair to students. Teaching through flexible and remote learning again is is a challenge, okay, in relation to access because the, Studying through modules, studying through, through textbooks, studying through internet is not easy for individuals, especially 
tayo ngayon ay naka-lockdown pa rin. Kahit sinasabi natin na GCQ, we are, we are still limited. And education, we all know this because we are all in the field of teacher education, involves a socialization process. We need to socialize with each other. Okay? And we need to reach out to people. We need to reach out to different learners. Okay? Education can never be complete without reaching out and touching uh, touching the lives of our students and all people that we will come to our needs. Okay, we need to look at the, the challenge related to quality. At this period of pandemic, we need to look at the quality of teaching that we give, the quality of learning that we provide to our students, the quality of instructional materials, the quality of the learning environment, whether that is virtual, remote, or residential. The quality of support system, academic and administrative support system that we give to our students. Remember, we are not just give, we are not just obliged to give the modules. We are also obliged to provide academic and administrative support, which is a promise of flexible learning to where the students are and bring all the services to them. Okay, the issue of relevance. We need to redefine our mission and vision. Okay, what is the purpose of teacher education at the period of COVID-19 pandemic? Simply to teach and to develop teachers or to develop teachers who are leaders in our educational processes and leaders in our society. People, leaders with a human heart. Okay, we need to redesign courses and programs. This is the, the a promise of... Uh, Flexible the learning that is still that it, that remains unrealized until now. Okay, we kept on providing modules, we kept on providing materials, but unless we re redesign our courses and programs, and my suggestion is remove all formative assessment at this period of pandemic and focus only on outcomes based assessment that are achieved at the end of the semester. Okay, which means we focus on summative assessment rather than formative assessment at this period of pandemic. We are in a difficult situation, my dear friends. During World War II, you remember the history of what we call the jungle university. Sometimes one reading is enough for the students to do a project or to do a reflection. Okay, and that really, and, and, and the, 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 more con the more concern of that jungle university is making sure that the students are still safe, that the students still use their brain, use their critical thinking and creativity to survive and to understand the difficult challenges that we are facing. At this period of pandemic, that is what we need now. We do not need to give a lot of requirements. We do not need to give a lot of lectures. We need, we do not need to give a lot of readings and all these unnecessary pedagogical uh, terms that we are giving to our students. What we need, what our students need now, and what we teachers need now, is a pedagogy of compassion and of love. Okay, meaning an outcomes-based assessment, outcomes-based teaching and learning that are more purposive. Okay, how many outcomes are there in a course? There are only three or four, sometimes maximum of five. Look at that course outcomes. So how come? How come we have a lot of formative requirements, formative assessment to our students? Karma, karma lang yan. Binibigyan niyo ang mga estudyante ng maraming trabaho, babalik din sa inyo. And I hope you read all these requirements and check them. Yung iba, hindi na binabasa, pero nagpapasubmit pa rin, nagpapasubmit. Okay, again and again, I'm encouraging everyone to show compassion and love to our students and show compassion and love to ourselves. Okay, responding, restructuring academic and administrative support system to help the students and responding to the needs of students and to the society to make it relevant. So what of type of teachers do we need? We need teachers who are innovative and creative at this period of pandemic. We need teachers who do not just follow rules, but who can think creatively on how to respond to the needs of the students. We need, we need teachers who are not just, just expert in pedagogy, but ex more, more on developing expertise in the discipline. Because um, the, this is the problem of teacher education. We teach a lot of strategies, but friends, these strategies are dictated by the outcomes, okay? So 
Kahit ano pang strategy ang bibigay mo, if these are not related, if this is not the demand of the learning outcomes, then things would be useless. In the Philippines, that's our main problem now. We are the only country in the world whose teacher education system or, or, or curriculum puts too much emphasis on teaching strategies without focusing on the content and without realizing that it's the content that drives and selects these strategies. Okay. And that there is no actually single pedagogy or strategy that is best for one subject. But it is, it is but this includes different approaches and strategies, okay, depending on the outcomes. We need teachers who are leaders in the educational system. They do not need to take positions, but the leaders who can make decisions, leaders or teachers who can lead, okay, in this in what we call social transformation. Teachers who can make decisions, who can make uh, changes without, uh, of course, sacrificing the quality of teaching and learning. We need teacher, teachers who can share their expertise to people, who can be a catalyst of social changes, okay, positive social change. We need teachers who will, of course, love their students, who can help in community programs, okay. So the needed paradigm shift in, in teacher education. One, we need while remaining local. Okay, we need to shift from local to global standards. So my challenge is move beyond the requirements of the professional standards for teacher education. I have problems with that. Okay, I read because I'm writing also a book, and I saw I, I read. Okay, I'm, 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 my, 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 my field is curriculum design. Okay, my dissertation is on curriculum standards. Okay, and I'm sorry to tell you if there are people here who are involved in the development of the PTSD, the PTSD may not be what we need now. And as teacher education, we need we need to know that, that the standards that are stated in PTSD must change because they that PTSD it's in itself doesn't meet okay the requirement of a de the development of what we call standards or curriculum standards we need to because there are already uh, the, there are several challenges in fact the, the other ano ba yung nauna sa atin noon bago PPST mas okay pa yon okay kaysa yung ngayon yung PPST na, na professional standards for professional teachers na na develop mas okay yung ano ba yung uh, competency na ginawa nung una na nakaraan nakalimutan ko na okay from too much emphasis on pedagogy to the development of what we call TPCK or technological pedagogical content knowledge okay because at this point of pandemic we need everyone to be technologically literate we need everyone to be pedagogically sound in terms of practice we need everyone to have ideas knowledge about the content of course of course we need that on curriculum knowledge and content knowledge from classroom teachers to school leaders, school leaders who can think creatively, innovatively, who, school leaders who, who are willing, okay, to take the risk, okay, to help every student learn. And from teaching to learning, because gone are those days when we are talk, talking about facilitating learning. Ang facilitating learning ay 20th century is, ano yan, concept yan. Wala na yan, pasay na yan. 21st century learning, we are talking here of instructional coaching. Instructional coaching na uso. Wala na yung facilitating learning. Pero sa ating education, nandyan pa rin yung facilitating learning. It's different when we say we facilitate learning. That's a different story. But the concept of facilitating learning is already a 20th century concept in teacher education, in this wide universe. Okay, siguro kahit sa Andromeda, ganun na rin. Ano? But sometimes it's more fun in the Philippines so we don't have funds for everything. It's more fun in such a way that we create a lot of things na tayo tayo lang nakakaalam believing that that is the right thing to do and it is the best thing to do but actually it's not okay from ayan yung sabi ko from facilitating to instructional coaching parang basketball tingnan niyo yung basketball ano ang ginagawa sa basketball first the coach must talk to the students to the players help them vision help them envision how to win help them strategize share to them their your expertise okay and after that develop a team spirit Develop the human, ignite the human spirit to learn and make a difference. And then from there, okay, allow them to play. Di ba? Pag naglalaro sila, and cheer them up. Give them an amount 
of in, a, amount of time, ample time, where they, they, they do things independently or collaboratively with each other to apply their knowledge and relate it to the everyday life. While, uh, while, do, while asking the students to do that, the, our role as teachers, of course, okay, is to motivate them and, of course, to support our students. Okay, tapos sa basketball, di ba, nagre-request ng recess or ng, ano, if, if there is a need to. So that is our role of instructional coaching. We share our expertise and experience to our students. From lesson planning to instructional design. Gone are those days when we're just talking here about the nine events of instruction. That's not the 1980 concept of, or 1950 concept. Now we are talking here of instructional design. Instructional design that is guided by learning in con in different contexts learning okay driven by the, the spirit of diversity learning that is formed with the spirit of inquiry okay from curriculum implementers to curriculum leaders okay we are not contented with the mle M, the milk but i would like to call it the milk challenge okay we are not com contented so what can we do okay do we still have to to implement something which is not Portable to all of us, only a curriculum leader can change something and do something with the curriculum. And therefore, we need our teachers, we need to develop teachers to be curriculum leaders. Curriculum leaders means they, they mean they, they means they, they can innovate, they can create changes, they can uh, manipulate the curriculum system okay, to help the students learn. It is they're not just following what the curriculum tells them, but they are they are actually. May doing more and adding more added value to the curriculum that they are implementing. Okay, the greater challenge then is to transform teachers to become leaders in social transformation through education. So move beyond the requirement of the professional Philippine professional standards for teacher education. Okay, we must go beyond the requirements of this PPSTE. After all, is it, it is teach, it is outcomes based education, which means the outcomes for teacher education is determined by your universities or colleges' vision and mission. Move beyond PPSTE. In other countries in the world, professional standards are there, okay, as a reflection of the things that they they, they as a reflection of. A certain portion of the things that teachers need to face when they are in a teaching profession, it is not there. Okay, professional standards are not there. Okay, to dictate and prescribe the content of curriculum and how we form teacher education. Okay, I guess we have to move away from that concept. Okay, and with that spirit, I beg to disagree with the Philippine professional standards for teacher education. I agree that we need the standards for teacher education, but that too must evolve and all cultures in Philippine context must be, must be considered, all ideologies must be considered, and we must develop a, a professional standards for teacher education that is more relevant and responsive to the diverse culture and I, diverse culture that we have as a Filipino. Okay, so... Uh, tama na yun. Baka marami na akong sabi sa PPSD dyan. Makapatayan na ako sa Zoom. Okay, sige. <laughs> what teacher leadership skills should teachers need? Again and again, the TPCK, we need to develop professional skills and values. Okay, see if this is are all in the TPCK, I uh, in, in the PPSD. Okay, organizational skills, collaborative skills, cultural literacy. Okay, these are defined by international standards and local standards. Respect for diversity. Siyempre, sasabihin, oh, nandun naman, nandun naman. Okay, but, okay, my challenge is you benchmark. We benchmark natin yon with other countries. Okay, including with other universities here in the Philippines. And you can see, okay, you can see the difference. Okay, and you can see how low it is compared to global standards and even to local conditions. Okay, we should move away from a Manila-driven curriculum to a more local oriented curriculum okay i i am proud i'm a proud graduate of the university of the philippines college of education but i do believe okay that expertise is not only confined within the walls of the liman republic as far as education is concerned and definitely it is not 
and it is never okay uh, a control of the Philippine Normal University and other and, and other teacher education institution. It's time that we have that pedagogy must evolve in the context of people, in the context of places, in the context of visions, in the context of experiences. Okay, problem solving and decision making and critical thinking. Okay, types of instructional materials needed. Okay, we need to, for the core courses, we need materials that develop core knowledge and skills, of course. We need materials that focus on critical reflection and inquiry learning. For the specialization courses, we need, to, we need materials that allows independent learning and, of course, focus on guided practice. And this will be all implemented with the aid of technology. And that is the reason why at this period of COVID-19 pandemic and in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, okay, modular instruction or modules are the best material that we can use to help our students. Okay, so how can we put all these things in uh, as instructional design for teacher education? So in curriculum, we have four elements, intent, content, learning experiences, and assessment. Therefore, in terms of intent and learning uh, and, uh, and, and uh, in terms of intent, our learning outcomes must reflect the needs of our students, our vision and mission, and of course, the nature of education as a profession. That's the essence of OBE, okay? A transformational type of OBE where teachers are developed for social transformation. We are not just developing teachers inside the classroom, okay? Ito yung palagi kong sinasabi. Yung pag pumasok ang isang, bat, ang isang teacher sa classroom, how, what do you see inside? If you see students, then you don't belong to the teaching profession. But if you see human beings, then welcome to the teaching profession because that is our job. That is our mission. That is what teaching is all about. It's doing mission in the service of our nation. Okay, teacher leadership is the focus of 21st century pedagogy, wherein pedagogy, content, Curriculum and technology evolves and revolves, okay, in the context of literature leadership where the students or where the teachers are making decisions, making innovations creatively, making teaching and learning more effectively. Where learning experiences focuses and for 21st century skills, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creatively. But you know what? The most difficult among the CIS is the second one, communication. Because you cannot communicate with you if you do not know the knowledge, if you do not know anything. Okay, ang hirap pagsalita. This is not, the, this is not an ability to speak in the English, Filipino, or foreign language. It's simply communicating ideas in different ways. Okay, and I would like to add two more Cs. Character. Character is what we need. Nawawala yung values ng teaching profession. Nawawala yung values ng mga and the most important skill of this 21st century and the centuries to come, I guess, is the last C that I am going to tell you. This last C includes what we call common sense. Sintido common. Yun ang nawawala sa mga estudante. Yun ang nawawala sa mga professionals. Ang daming matatalino, walang common sense. Okay, in terms of assessment, we do, we, we, we help our students develop performance tasks or performance-based assessment. That will require us to focus on the four, five okay, the elements of instruction. Think, experience, assess, challenge, and harness. This is it. In think, they think of theory and challenges. For experience part, they look at realities, reality of life and issues inside the classroom and in the greater society. For assess, it focuses on critical thinking. For challenge, it focuses on critical reflection and decision making. For the last part, to harness, focuses on the application of knowledge, creativity, and innovation. The pedagogical framework now, the evolving pedagogy of 21st century learning must focus on what, we, what I call, okay, the circle, circles of learning. Okay, it, it, it includes different concentric circles. First, we must teach and concepts, and from teaching concepts and skills, we need to transform or develop this concept and skills into cognitive tasks for the students. When the students were able to develop it as a cognitive task, 
then it, uh, it is our duty to transform this cognitive task into 21st century skills. After developing the cognitive task into 21st century skills, we need to transform these skills into habits of mind. Habits of mind is now the, the, the game of what we call the 21st century learning. And at the end of the day, at the end of each activity or pedagogical activity that we provide, we must ensure that everything should ignite in the, the development of what we call the human spirit okay, among us, among our students. Now we are implementing flexible uh, uh, teacher education in a flexible learning mode. There are three phases of flexible learning. Okay, The remote mode, ito ngayon sa atin, walang face-to-face. -face. The, the students must receive their, their instruction, their module through online and through other means. Okay, That's what we call the remote mode of flexible learning. The blended learning is when the vaccine will come in, but not all as, as yet uh, vaccinated. So, okay, we will meet. There are, there are several classes where, where they can still meet. Okay, but of course, using technology, okay, we can now we can now develop the we can now in, uh, implement what we call blended learning. Kasi napakaaga ngayon na mag blended learning. Okay, that is what we call the blended approach, flexible education, where the, some of the lessons will be done online or some of the lessons should be done in, in a distance mode, while others will be done in a face to face regular instruction. And the phase three is what we call adaptive flexible learning, where adaptive technologies will be used, focusing on the needs and the nature of the learners. Okay, here is the, the Bloom's tax, uh, the, the taxonomy. Okay. okay uh, Craftwall and Andersen, okay, developed or redesigned. This to include what we call creative. But here, you have to remember the problem of teacher education is that we put too much emphasis on what we call higher order thinking skills. Believing that lower order thinking skills, kasi negative yung law, ay hindi maganda ituro. Friends, it's not a class, it's a classification. It's not hierarchy, it's not simply a hierarchy. You cannot create if you do not remember or understand a concept. You cannot apply something that we do not know. The problem of our education system now, now is that we are too ambitious focusing on create on the higher order level the thinking skills, but we forgot the prerequisites. We forgot the essential. We forgot that the small things, that the, 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 the one that we call lower order thinking skills are the foundations of knowledge. Okay. We need to help the students remember and understand first before they do so, so many things. Okay. So, anong essence dito sa flexible learning? If the outcomes focuses, outcome or outcomes focus or focuses on understanding and remembering, then it is your duty and my duty to process it. Therefore, in terms of assessment, traditional assessment is best. Wala pong nagsasabi, I'm, I'm sure, binanggit ni Ruel kahapon, that authentic assessment is the best or there is bet, a better form of assessment. Okay, there is authentic is not better than, uh, than traditional. And traditional is not better than authentic. The best assessment is based on the outcomes. So we followed what we call the outcomes-based assessment. Okay. So if it's, okay, it requires understanding and remembering, then in flexible learning, they will be use what we call the synchronous instruction. Okay. But if you ask the students to perform and produce, produce, that's what I call the three piece of learning. If you want them to apply, analyze, evaluate, and create, then it will require a synchronous learning, okay, that will require authentic assessment. So what I'm trying to do to say here is that if there are 30, 30 meetings in one semester for a regular classroom in a flexible learning, divided, divide that into two, make it 15. Five will be for synchronous. That means you meet only your students once a month, twice if needed. Okay, the rest will be asynchronous. But then make sure that in the asynchronous instruction, don't bombard your students with a lot of irrelevant, required and un unthinkable assessment. Okay, at this period of pandemic, we remember the four C's. Okay, we need to show compassion. Okay, compassion to our students, compassion to ourselves, to our families, and to the whole world. Okay. Nobody is prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Okay, we are all hopeful by God's grace that we will all of we can overcome this pandemic, and I'm sure and I think we will. Okay, we need to communicate with each other. We need to communicate our concerns. We need to communicate our best practices with each other. Okay, friends, this is not the time for us to complain to our administrators. Stop complaining. Nobody is laughing or smiling at this period of pandemic. No institution with the right mind will tell you that they are doing the best or what. Okay, hindi. Ito, lahat ito nahihirapan, even in other countries. Okay, lahat nahihirapan. We should show compassion. Stop complaining. Yun yung first C that you have to avoid, complaining. There is no room for complaining. But you can communicate your worries. You can communicate your problems. You com can communicate your issues. We can communicate. And we need to collaborate. Collaborate with other higher education institutions. Collaborate with other teacher education institutions. Collaborate with your enemies in the department. Collaborate with your friends and colleagues, with students and families, with LGUs. Okay? To think of things that we, how, how we can do. Okay? Things that we can do, I mean to solve the problems of teacher education and of our education system. Collaboration is the name of the game. It's the spirit of flexible learning at this period of pandemic. And if there's the second C that we need to, to, to remove or forget at this period of pandemic is competing. Okay, this is not for us to, that a time for us to compete with each other, to compete with our colleagues, to compete with other TEIs. This is the time for us to show compassion and love to everyone. The last is creativity. We need to be very creative in doing things. We do not just rely on what the superiors will tell you. We don't just rely on what the Commission on Higher Education tells you to do. But we should have the initiative. Because after all, we know what is best for our students. Chad will always be there to, to, to help you. And honestly, because I worked in CHED for several uh, for several years as TEC, it became the chief, okay, of uh, uh, in the central office for some time, okay. I I tell you, ito, ito yung na appreciate ko ngayon sa Commission on Higher Education. I guess they are doing a great job, and congratulations for that. How you handle the flexible learning uh, issues and all the issues. I mean. The demands and issues that we are experiencing now in higher education. Our ways may not be perfect, okay, but at this time we can see higher education institution and we can see the commission in higher education working together with working together to help the Filipino students. Okay, with that, thank you very much and God bless you. Remember, okay, this is something that I learned from my great teacher in, in, in UP. Because nowadays, in teacher education or in education in general, we are bombarded with many rules, with many uh, orders or what. Ito yung natutunan ko. Sabi ng professor ko si Dr. Adriano, Greg, there are moments in this life when it is better to break a rule than to break students or to break the students or break the people's lives. Okay, friends. This time of pandemic, the best pedagogy is the pedagogy of compassion, a curriculum of compassion, a teacher education curriculum that is filled of, with compassion. Ta I would like, again, medyo naging ano -ano ko, passionate ako <laughs> sa topic na yan. Okay. Noong ako'y nasa College of Education sa, sa UP, uh, sinasabi nila na ay tapunan ng mga bagsakan, nagbagsakan sa ibang college ang sa education. Tapunan ng hindi masyadong marunong sa UP system ang College of Education. Masakit, hindi naman totoo. Pero ito lang sasabihin ko. Kung totoo man natapunan tayo, we, are, we should be proud because that is the mission and that is what teacher education is all about. To provide second chance, third chance, or many chances to students because we believe that in teaching and learning, you and I can make a difference with or without a PhD, with or without a professor. Uh, with, with or without a master's degree or position, position, we are in the best position to help this nation to teach and touch stu students' lives, transform this nation with honor and excellence. Again, thank you and God bless you.
Thank you, Dr. Greg, for discussing straightforwardly and clearly the evolution of pedagogy and teacher education at the period of COVID-19 pandemic. Now we have new ways, methods, and practices of teaching with compassion and with love to our students. He was also challenging us to move beyond the standards and develop a human spirit to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Greg Tabius Pawilen, our second speaker. Please give her, him a, a virtual applause. All right. Thank you, Dr. Greg. Now let us move on to our third speaker, the last speaker, but definitely not the least, to talk on modeling effective classroom management in a, a synchronous and synchronous learning mode is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts, major in philosophy and minor in history at Ateneo de Manila University. Master degree in educational foundations, major in education psychology, and about to graduate in her doctorate degree in education, major in special education on June 2021 20, at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Our third speaker also presented papers in international and national conferences. She has also developed modules such as job coaching training module for Miriam College in partnership with Project Inclusion and upon consultation with IDEA initiatives on March 2019 and many others. At present, she is the department chairperson of the College of Education, Miriam College. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our last speaker in today's webinar, Professor Christina Nieves Aligada Halal, ma'am. Hi, good morning, everybody. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Kinabahan po ako dun sa sinabing ng graduate ako ng June 2021. Yun po ay um, ano po yan talaga, aking goal. <laughs> but uh, because of the pandemic, um, well, I'm still hoping that I, I remain steadfast in that ano, in that objective. But thank you, Dr. Lisa, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to greet everyone um, here uh, in Zoom and uh, on uh, those tuning in on Facebook. A wonderful morning, um, especially to our uh, CHED officials and our representatives from Rex uh, Bookstore. Uh, also to to Dr. Greg Pawilen, um, who is um, a colleague in um, in Rex. Um, okay, na napakahirap pong sumunod kay Dr. Greg. Eh. <laughs> Pero <clears throat> I will try my very best to um, match his level of energy. Ayan po. So this after uh, this morning, I will be presenting to you um, modeling effective classroom management in a synchronous and synchronous learning mode. So this is the the topic that was assigned to me for this morning. Okay, so um, again, just to uh, reintroduce myself. So I am Teacher Tina. Uh, my colleagues call me Teacher Tina. Um, I am a, actually a SPED and inclusive ed practitioner, um, a, a PhD candidate in special education, but my master's degree is in educational psychology. Uh, currently, I am a professor in special education, inclusive education, and educational psychology. So I uh, today I'm representing Miriam College, but actually uh, most of the things that I will be talking about this morning um, are, well, these are, are actually the, the examples that I will be showing you are from my classes in UP. Um, so I teach Ed Psych in UP Diliman. So, um, okay, because you have been online since 8, 8 a.m., 8.30 today, um, Ano po tayo? No, konting ano lang. Um, kamustahan. So, kamusta na po ba kayo? <laughs> After two um, topics for this morning's webinar. And maybe in general. So, how are you feeling today? Um, for those in uh, here in Zoom, I hope you can um, answer in the chat box how you're feeling using the colors that you see. So, uh, pwedeng colors, pwedeng ano yung pinaka um, nararamdaman ninyo. Okay. So, maraming green. All right, maraming very productive and happy, which is a, such a refreshing thing to, ano, to, to find out. Kasi 
you know, when I ask this in my classes, um, they usually answer red or black. Uh, sometimes, some of them purple, pero maraming very, very anxious. Um, I have not, well, well I, I'm used to, to uh, asking this question to my students. No? So, ang ganda na nakikita natin ito sa teachers. So, I, I assume it's the teachers who are, ayun, may isang black. <laughs> meron, meron tayong teachers na ang mindset is very positive. No? So, um, what, what we're doing now is actually called the check-in. So I check in. This is something that I do every every session that I have with my students, whether asynchronous or synchronously, because um, this is this check in is um, some sort of litmus test for me to find out how my class is and how I am supposed to adjust my my session or uh, how do, how should I adjust um, maybe the the delivery how I am going to deliver my my um, lesson. Or maybe even the, mater uh, the, the, um, the materials or the requirements that I'll be asking of my students. Um, so maraming, maraming nakukuha from a simple question such as this. Um, so mamaya po, ipapakita ko sa inyo um, ano pang mga pwedeng gawin. No? But um, for this morning, for my topic, this is actually the main question that I would like to address. So how do we guarantee that students are learning? This is actually a question that Dr. Jonna Lim um, had posed earlier today um, when she was talking about um, yung, yung, paano, paano best matutulungan ng ating mga student teachers. So this is actually my question as well. Pero dadagdagan natin ng without teachers becoming too overwhelmed. Okay, so how do we guarantee that students are learning without teachers becoming too overwhelmed? Because... Um, I, I think this is a very important question to ask and a very important thing to also consider because, um, you know, uh, the, the mindset now that we're doing remote learning, remote teaching, is that uh, we have to, uh, to make sure that students are learning. But in the process, we tend to focus on a lot of requirements, a lot of, of things that... Um, ultimately overwhelm the teacher. So it's either, dalawa lang yan, it's either gagawin ng teacher lahat ng sinabi niya gagawin niya, pero pagod na pagod siya, or hindi, niya, hindi rin mag, mag, magagawa yung mga, um, mga objectives ng teacher because nga, um, in guaranteeing that students are learning, dumadagdag, uh, yun ang tendency, dumadagdag ng dumadagdag ang requirements or ang ginagawa natin. And these are things that actually Dr. Jonna and Dr. Greg we're also talking about earlier. So um, they did mention the importance of, of simplifying things, but making sure that, you know, we preserve the integrity of our, our courses. So that is actually, well, I, I was, I was um, very pleased to hear these from, uh, from our two speakers earlier, because this is, this is um, maybe um, a reinforcement of that, of that principle. Okay. So, for today, my talk points will be, well, I, I just have two parts. So first, I will be discussing what classroom management is, and then looking at classroom management in a flexible learning environment. And then the second part would be uh, giving you practical tips for synchronous and asynchronous sessions. So I'll show you actual classes that I've done um, that might, might help you. Okay, so first, part one, what is classroom management? So uh, I'd like you now to, uh, okay, so sorry. So classroom management, um, this is according to education.gov.gy, the use of procedures and te uh, teaching techniques that promote a safe and efficient learning environment. There are actually a lot of, of definitions of classroom management, but this one, this definition, um, I think is something that responds to me because um, this is very important now that we're doing remote learning. Um, the, it's the idea of making sure that that the environment is safe for our learners and for for the teachers, and then making sure that of course things are still efficient. Because di ba sayang naman yung nagpapagod tayo. We we design a lot of our lessons. We give them a lot of we give our students a lot of of requirements, but but at the end of the day, hindi siya efficient, and and we end up overwhelmed or very very tired. And so when that happens learning suffers because our the way that we teach will suffer. So we don't want that. So we need to make sure 
that we uh, are able to manage our class as well. So um, in a nutshell, classroom management ensures that actual learning takes place and it allows for a more relaxed teaching experience for teachers. So it's twofold. Tinitignan natin yung mga students, pero tinitignan din natin yung sarili natin. Okay, so um, I'd like to ask. So again, for those here on Zoom, I'd like to ask, so before the pandemic, how did you manage your classes? Okay, so you can type um, maybe just a, a phrase or maybe as, um, if, if it's just one word, uh, can you please type, how did you manage your classes pre-pandemic? Okay, so bago nagkaroon ng lockdown. Okay, so let's let's review. So yeah, nagbe blended learning. Okay, so good. Kasi nga, as we all know, blended learning is not exactly a new concept. It has been done in the past. Okay, so yes, face to face. So pero paano natin mina manage? So kunwari, um, do we consider, for example, arrangement of our seats? positioning, saan, paano, paano yung mga estudyante natin, saan tayo pupuesto sa classroom, etc. Okay, so tingnan natin. Okay, most of you have answered blended learning. Okay, so system, systematic and organized. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, you can't claim to manage your class if there is no organization and no system in place. No? Kasi yun nga yung secret doon, no? to, to managing our class as well. We develop our own ways of doing things um, in such a way that we understand the system and it's easy to implement for our students. Okay. Um, someone said, observing the usual routine, meron nagsasabing classroom mapping, arranging seats alphabetically. So um, those who have sight problems um, are, are placed in front of the class, okay. And then the use of classroom rules and then distance seats, especially in exams. So um, thank you very much for your answers. You know, these are actually things nga, that, that help, um, again, ensure that learning takes place and that it's not go go going to be too hard for teachers to implement. Um, the thing is, diba, um, so maraming, maraming mga, mga ways of, of implementing classroom management. Kanya-kanya tayo ng style dyan. But we find um, upon, well, upon review of, um, of research and, and readings also on classroom management, no matter what your, your style is, no matter how old your students are, or no matter how new or how seasoned you are as a teacher, there are elements of classroom manage, management that, run, that cut across all of these things. So merong mga similarities um, among our practices. And I'd like to, to um, show you some of these components or these elements. So first is classroom design. So looking at things pre-COVID, okay? So nung nag-face-to-face -face classes pa tayo, usually ang ginagawa ng mga teachers. So there is intentionality of design. Dr. Joanna discussed this earlier. Dr. Greg also mentioned it, that it's important that when we design our classrooms, Kumbaga, what, lahat ng nasa classroom natin merong dahilan. We don't put it there just for aesthetic purposes or just because we feel like doing um, it. It's, it's nice to look at or um, gusto ko siyang itry. Usually, we do things because there is a reason for, for doing so. Um, and for face-to-face -face classes, that usually also um, centered on lessening distractions. So, Pwedeng positioning furniture. So, for example, I've, I've uh, observed classes in the higher education where um, yung para siyang, what do you call this, the bigger classrooms na, na parang um, orchestra type na mer yung teacher nasa gitna tapos pataas yung mga upuan and then paikot, semicircle, uh, tapos nandun yung lahat ng students. So, pwedeng ganun. Meron, meron akong ibang um, classes na na-observe na paikot, especially for small classes, um, yung teacher, kasama siya dun sa bilog. So wala siya sa gitna, wala siya sa, well, hindi siya nakahiwalay, pero part siya. So, so um, I've, I've heard teachers who prefer this type of classroom arrangement to say that it, um, it helps students feel that the teacher is an equal and is, it, it, the teacher is part of the class at hindi siya, hindi siya tagabag, tagapagbigay lang ng information but is also part of the session so it's it's 
very good if if your mindset is I'm here to facilitate a learning session. So yun, yung mga ganun, no? those um those actually spell a big difference when it comes to classroom management. Um mahirap pag big class, no? Uh, kasi nga ang tendency mo, eh, hindi mo na control lahat ng mga nasa klase mo. So you don't know if the ones at the back are listening to you, you're not sure if someone's sleeping, if someone's doing work for for other classes, di ba? So, important yung positioning. And then checking for safety as well. Like For example, for younger classes, younger students, yung safety is of utmost importance. Um, and then you have organization. Someone mentioned it earlier, systematic and organized. So it's a clear system for, for example, your use of materials, for filing of works, documents, even the way that you teach. Uh, paano mo inorganize yung 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 one and a half hours mo for the day uh, with your class. So, puro lecture lang ba yan? Or, or do you look at um, group sessions or collaborative sessions, um, etc. Um, when I used to, uh, 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 well, in, in my college classes, um, uh, when we were doing face-to-face classes, so I usually would, there are some, some schedules wherein um, I would teach Tuesdays and Thursdays, so one and a half hours each. So usually, ako ang ginagawa ko, one and a half hour, uh, yung, yung Tuesday, one and a half hours ko would be for lectures and for me imparting information. And then Thursdays would be group work, collaborative work, etc. cetera. Um, that's going to be hard now that we're doing online or distance learning kasi nga, hindi mo, mah- mahirap mag-collaborate online. Um, so, Later, yeah, I'll, I'll also present some ideas on how I've managed to to um, maybe turn things around. Um, another component to classroom management is communication. Uh, in emphasize it in the first two talks, no, the importance of connection, especially now that we're doing class uh, that we're doing distance learning. So connection in terms of you building rapport with your class. Na subukan yun na po bang magturo tapos walang nagsasalita. Actually, in Zoom, that's that's always the case, di ba? Um, nagsasalita ka, ni mo alam wala ka na pala sa Zoom. Uh, that happened to me just the other day. I was giving a webinar for a Manila Book uh, International Book Fair, and I was talking, talking, talking for 30 minutes. Yun pala, 30 minutes na kung wala sa Zoom. No? So, in, you couldn't tell the difference because when, like, for example, here, I know I'm online now. I know I'm broadcasting, but no one's talking. No one is no. There's no um, actual interaction. So so, you know, um, we have to be mindful all the time as to um, our presence, our rapport, even when we cannot directly communicate with our students. Uh, authority is also very important. Kung ikaw yung type ng professor or ng teacher na hindi naririnig masyado yung yung bosses mo, tapos uh, hindi ka pa rin nirespeto ng mga estudyante mo. Thankfully, wala pa akong ganun <laughs> na experience. But, you know, you could you could just imagine, like, for example, in movies, no, na um, the teacher isn't respected, yung mga pinapakita nilang portrayal of difficult classes. Um, so we know the importance of building our authority, not just as, you know, someone, uh, uh, maybe a con- someone considered an expert in the field, but also, Authority in the class. Now, whatever you say, kailangan susundin ng mga estudyante. Kasi mahirap naman na, na di ba, you're, you're teaching, pero sinisecond guess ka all the time. So, building authority and, and being responsive to the needs of others is very, very important. Also, uh, rules and discipline. In face-to-face sessions, we, we were taught that we have to develop rules. Someone mentioned it earlier um, in the chat box na, Yung rules ay napaka-importante because these are, and these are rules that have to foster respect, care, and a sense of community. And um, we all know that in order for rules to, to, to work, they actually have to be constantly and consistently implemented. So um, rules can help develop the discipline that, that um, is needed in order for us to conduct our classes better. Scheduling is also another element. So scheduling can come in the form of routines that allow us to stay on time and on task. And therefore, if we're on task, then 
um, more or less it it assures us of of actual learning also kasi nakikita natin yung progress ng mga estudyante natin and finally instructional technique meaning um maybe it's it, it's the ability also of the teacher to tailor fit techniques so that students um uh, so that the teachers respond to the needs and the nature of of the students so this is more about aligning activities with goals and intentions so the thing is now, we have all of these things about classroom management, but now we're doing flexible learning. So how is it, um, how, how will we be able to, to impart or to implement classroom management despite uh, our current situation? So just um, let me just remind you what flexible learning is. Um, Sir Greg had discussed this earlier, but uh, let me just um, reiterate now that flexible learning uh, a flexible learning environment is not just um, the idea that, okay, we're saying something is online or something is offline or something is blended. It involves the restructuring of curriculum elements uh, to the point that we sometimes will have to redesign courses depending on the needs of our students and our context. So we create a learning environment that is needs-based and learner-based. And um, in the process, we empower the learners and offer them a choice in how, what, where, and when they learn. So um, it's essentially, you know, taking into consideration pace, place, and mode. Okay, so in higher education, we know now after several months of, of teaching remotely, we know that CHED espouses flexible learning for higher education. And so... Having this in mind, how can we do classroom management? Okay, um, let me go back to this, to the, the six elements that I introduced earlier, but let's look at it from a distance learning or, or a flexible learning perspective. Uh, earlier, we said classroom design is important. Perhaps it's not just for distance learning, it's not just classroom design that is significant, but class design. Okay, so the idea of how you form your, your course in such a way that you stay true to the, the course outcomes, the learning outcomes, you stay true to outcomes-based learning, uh, outcomes-based education, um, but also, again, making sure that you're not too tired as a teacher at the end of the day. Kasi yun nga, pag pagod si teacher, hin mahirap, mahirap magturo and, and learning will suffer. I cannot... Um, emphasize that enough. No? So again, we go back to intentionality of design. In my experience, um, having having um, taught uh, online um, since we started the pandemic, I feel that one of one of the most uh, one of the most effective ways um, to reach out to learners and ensure um, genuine learning is by using problem based and or project-based learning. Because um, by, by doing problem-based and uh, or project-based learning, things suddenly become contextualized and um, uh, it provides our learners with opportunities to actually apply what we've learned. So, so parang ang nangyayari ngayon, my role has shifted to actually facilitating learning instead of just imparting knowledge. Parang nag-shift yun slightly so that now I curate my, my um, uh, readings, I curate the information that goes down to my students. Uh, as Dr. Greg said earlier, wag naman yung binabato natin lahat ng readings na pwede kasi ang feeling natin, higher education na sila, kaya na nila yan. But again, we look at context. So, um, of course, this also, you know, th th this... Um, uh, design would also depend on the nature of course that you that you teach. But um, I find that for foundation courses or for courses that um, look at theory, one of the best things to, to look into would be problem-based learning. So for example, I teach ed psych courses. Um, I teach educational psychology in the college level. And so um, what I do is introduce the theories um, and then have them identify a problem um, that they would like to, to uh, consider and then use that, th that identified problem um, as a means to, to grapple with the theories that they've learned in my class. So, merong, 
merong application and there is a way of doing things in such a way na namo-monitor mo pa rin yung learning throughout the SEM. So later yon ipapakita ko rin how. Um and then the the importance of of um choosing also what is more relevant or yeah, not relevant but what is more appropriate for your course for the nature of your course or maybe for the the course outcomes is it formative assessment or summative assessment i find that um of course may kanya kanyang ano yan may kanya kanyang um um uh, use um ang formative and summative assessment but for the nature of courses that i teach i find that formative assessment is the way to go simply because it's a way for me to um, lessen the requirements that I give. So, mas intentional yung requirements na nabibigay ko, kumukonte, and then building towards one huge requirement. So, parang it's one huge requirement na tinatask analyze or bini breakdown per session. And then that's usually when I, when I do um, teaching or monitoring. So, so pwedeng ganun. Um, for me, napadali ang buhay ko kesa yung nag- nag-iisip ako, okay, magpapa-quiz muna ako and then after quiz, magpapa-essay ako, ganyan. Kasi yun na nga, the requirements at the end of the SEM, they build up. And it is very important that the feedback happens as you teach the class. Uh, I have to say, even yung pagbibigay ng feedback, that is very, very difficult to do. And I myself have difficulty doing it on time. But it's something that we we work on um, despite the the limitations that we have. I, ako, I, I am always limited by the time that I, I have. With it. Parang kulang 24 hours no? <laughs> in a day for teachers um, and seven, five days a week of working. Kulang na kulang siya, but you make do with what you have. Um, so, so, yeah, um, class design is very, very important. Intentionality of design is um, something that is very much doable and not just doable, but it's, it's, I think it would be found the foundation of um, flexible learning. Um, organization is also important, and it's not just you know the the organization, but the org organization or your system has to be something that is understood by all. Kasi di ba? I don't think it will be an effective system kung at the end of the day, ikaw lang yung nakakaintindi ng sistema mo. So, kung hindi mo siya tinuro dun sa estudyante mo, hindi mo inexplain why you're doing things the way you're doing it, um, it might not be as, as relevant. So, make sure that you communicate this system to your class because you don't want to spend most of your, of your, your session or most of your week answering questions na hindi relevant dun sa topic. Mas, ang, ang questions may kinalaman dun sa ano ba yung dapat gawin hindi dun sa ano yung learning na kailangan kong makuha from this. So, we want to, uh, you know, lessen the, the, the opportunities that students, uh, um, or maybe we want to make sure that the questions that we get are the relevant ones, the ones that have to do with, with learning. Um, also, communication. So, um, because we're doing distance learning, it is very, very important that we stay connected. So the rapport, again, as I mentioned, it's it's difficult to, to achieve now, but it's doable. And we should be able to at least establish some sort of connection even when we're doing things offline. We have to include regulatory measures as well because one of the things that um, I see happening is that, you know, in our, um, in our desire to stay connected, and to feel to show our students that we understand them sometimes we go beyond office hours uh, i know how how difficult things can be um, you know managing our time especially managing our 8 to 5 schedule but uh, hindi rin naman may iwasan na minsan alauna, alas dos ng umaga, alas tres, doon tayo nagtatrabaho or doon, doon nagtatrabaho ang mga estudyante natin. Kasi nga, as Sir Greg mentioned, doon lang na, na free yung internet or doon lang na free yung gadgets. Um, so let's put some, some markers or some limits to that. So for example, in my class, what I do is I tell them, um, I apologize, sometimes I will be, I will be um, posting learning requirements or, or uh, sending emails beyond office hours because 
um, I also do, um, you know, I, I run my household and I also do a lot of things. We attend meetings, di ba? Naming meetings pag faculty ka. So, so minsan yung actual teaching nangyayari siya after office hours. So, I tell them, so I, parang ang, ang ginagawa ko, nag-apologize ako agad na, okay, there will be moments that I will be emailing you um, beyond office hours. Please do not feel pressured to answer me uh, right away. Um, you can answer um, when needed. But uh, ganun din, no? So, parang at the same time, kung kayo, mag email kayo sa akin, um, please know that I will not be able to answer all the time. Uh, or I won't be able to answer immediately, especially if it's um, mare alas 9 na ng gabi or madaling araw na or if it's on a weekend. Because, you know, as much as possible, we also, we want to stay connected but make sure that the limits are respected. There should be boundaries so that we don't lose ourselves in the process. Okay? Um, and then rules and discipline. So we develop rules that foster, again, respect, care, and a sense of community. And these must be aligned with, with the idea of flexible learning. Okay, so again, sabi natin, di ba, flexible learning has to do with um, adjusting to students' needs, to learners' needs and context. Um, for example, uh, parang mahirap naman, no, magpaparul ka na, na uh, you can only ask questions during class hours. Kung hindi yun ang context ng estudyante mo kasi um, pag umaga, heavy ang, ang internet traffic sa bahay at mahirap mag-send mag ng emails or, ng, ng, or mag-post ng, ng questions, um, di ba? Bar parang that's, that's not going to be fair to the student. So let's look at, um, you know, the rules. Um, maybe not relaxing it a bit, but Kasi yung iba natatakot sa term na relax, relaxing things a bit or change. Kasi parang feeling nila pag nagre-relax ka, bumababa ang standards. That's not necessarily the case. So we just, you know, have to remember um, ano ba yung, yung reason natin for doing this. What is our main goal in the course that we teach? And then make sure to stay true to that. So, so pakawala na natin yung mga yung ibang mga rules that are superfluous or things that won't help the the student and would just add to the stress. Remember, when students are stressed, we also in turn become stressed. So there, um, scheduling, considering uh, possibilities that a strict schedule may not necessarily be followed. Um, as I said, no, I I have classes. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, this sem. So we're doing distance learning, uh, online learning this semester. So what I, I tell my students is that every Monday, I will be posting everything so that you have a choice as to when you would like to, um, to do our work. So I won't be, I won't be adding uh, requirements on Tuesday or Thursday, etc. And then ang deadlines ko for the week are Sagad, so Friday or Saturday, okay, na kailangan. So we, I post the, the materials Monday. Um, they can work on it anytime, but to submit sila ng Friday. And if the, if it happens that they don't get to submit on a Friday, or they go beyond the the um, my deadline, that's okay. Walang deduction, <laughs> At it, it's not going to affect the grade uh, because nga we don't know what's happening to our students in. Um, during this time. So so we, we want to be as flexible as possible with the way that we do things. Um, and then instructional technique, again, tailor-fitting techniques so that the students' uh, needs and goals um, are respected, are recognized, and are considered. So we make sure that we align the activities with the goals and intentions. So how do we do all of these things? So ito na ta dito tayo sa practical tips on classroom management. Um, I found uh, um, an article, actually it's, an, it's on Edutopia uh, by Johnson in 2016, which I, I think this, this, um, his article resonates a lot, um, especially now that we're doing remote learning. So this is the five priorities of classroom management. And he uh, centers on five ideas or five concepts. So um, it's relational, uh, relationship building, 
It's teaching learning expectations, time, empathy and intuitive lesson planning, and then behavioral and academic standards. So let's look at relationship building. So Johnson said, develop working relationships with your students. So here, this is uh, what I normally do um, now that we're doing online learning. If it's a synchro if it's synchronous classes, um, and, and I have to say, no, I don't do a lot of synchronous sessions. Why? Because, you know, we have difficulty with internet. Hindi lang yung mga estudyante, kahit ako. Um, for example, this week, for some reason, nahihirapan ako sa Gmail. So I've been having difficulties. You know, I, I'm online now, but I'm having difficulty with posting um, on Google Classroom. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's just me. I'm not sure. But, you know, it happens. And so... Um, what I'm saying is that, you know, um, it's ve very volatile, our situation, and we don't want to rely too much on, on technology for synchronous. So, so as much as possible, if we can minimize synchronous sessions, that would be great. Um, so what we do, uh, what I do uh, to foster relationship building during synchronous sessions, I make sure I have check-ins. So something similar to what I did earlier um, in my session. So I asked the question, how are you all today? And then the um, participants or, or, or students just answer in the Zoom chat box. Um, so we can also do, for example, uh, an actual you know, a verbal check-in. So, so like, for example, I meet my students on my second day of class. A lot of students or a lot of teachers um, schedule their synchronous sessions on day one. I schedule it. I schedule mine day two. Why? Because on day one, usually maraming hindi pa in the classes kasi nahihirapan pa with connection or meron pang problema with enrollment or hindi pa nakakapasok, hindi pa nakaregister sa, sa class, sa virtual class, etc. So I don't want my students to miss out on, on synchronous sessions. And so I, I um, usually I email them first or I, I um, when, when, well, I use Google Classroom. So when I do, I post initial instructions there and then give them a schedule na by, by um, session two, mag-synchronous session tayo. Because by then, it would be easier for me to design the synchronous class. So um, I have a check-in, a synchronously muna. So yeah, and usually but my first question would be, what is your current state of mind? And then how is your internet connection? Um, we can do polls here, polls or surveys uh, to do that. But also please make sure that, or keep in mind, that surveys are only as good as the time that you answered the survey. Um, in UP, we're given a list at the start of the semester. We're given a list of um, how the internet connection and how the gadget uh, av availability is for each student. Pero you know, when I did the synchronous session, uh, marami sa kan so, so, yeah, so yung, yung survey, na binigay sa akin, it said parang 80% of my class had their own gadgets and had strong internet or at least um, workable internet connection. But, you know, during our uh, our synchronous session, when we did check-ins, they said, Mag magulo yung internet ngayon. Um, tapos yun nga, big biglang, actually ako rin, nung time na yun, wala na ko ng internet kasi nakalimutan ako magbayad <laughs> ng internet. So, no, no, yung mga gano, no? uh, that's part of the reality. Na puputulan ka ng internet connection, and so um, let's not rely too much on the surveys because again, it's own it, the the results are only as good as the time that they took that survey. So ask all the time, do check ins, and in the same way that you know we're asking our students to trust us, maybe we should also trust our students that they're not lying to us. That they really are having difficulties um, with their connection or with their gadget use or with their, their their mental health. A lot of them are struggling. So um, we do relationship building so that they they are sure that um, we know that they're suffering, um, they have mental health concerns, and that we're going to be flexible with this. Okay, so dapat alam nila na. It's not an excuse. 
we still will be asking things from them, but we will consider certain things depending on on well um, on a case to case basis. Huh? Um, during synchronous sessions, I also make sure to to have interactive activities. Actually, the only times that I do synchronous sessions for for college for the college classes is to build relationships. That's all, and to um, explain my my um, course for the the semester, how it's going to go, what's my instruction. Ma'am Christina, excuse me, yes. po. Parang may nag echo po daw. Oh. Uh, Okay, well, let's see. Well, how to, <laughs> to address. Um, okay, anyway, um, may pong wala naman po. maybe it's the connection of the nga, realities of ano. <laughs> of, okay, po, <laughs> ma'am. Okay, pero sige pa, just let me know po if, if um, it's getting better. Okay, po, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so. Asking questions that can be easily answered individually if doing synchronous sessions um, and only for relationship building. Kanina sabi ni, ni Dr. Jona, um, wag questions na yes or no lang. Correct yon, but I think for academic, um, more for academic concerns. But if it's relationship building, you want to at least get a feel of your class. So the simpler questions, the better for relationship building. Okay, so ayun po. Um, and then uh, thematic virtual backgrounds. Uh, I I know of well, I have a colleague in in UP who um, when they do synchronous sessions, she invites students to come up with virtual backgrounds. So kunare o team natin ngayon coffee or uh, cafe, uh, coffee place. So patingin na mga virtual backgrounds. So yung, yung ganun, no things like that, things that are very very simple but actually help. Um, solidify your relationship with your students. And then share stories. So ako sinasabi ko sa kanila, I meet you synchronously mostly so that you have an opportunity to ask me questions. If there are things that um, we did in a synchronous sessions that are not clear, then we can do it synchronously and I can explain it to you in much more detail. And then that's also the time when I share my stories. Para kilala nila ako. And then I ask questions that would um, allow them to share their stories to me. So, so you know, um, nakikita ko ano yung context ng mga estudyante ko. So, for example, uh, for this semester, I had one student who actually, uh, whose mom um, was COVID positive in the middle of the SEM. So, she started um, having difficulties uh, um, submitting requirements kasi siya yung nag nung lahat. Uh, and everybody else was isolated. They all got tested, etc. So, you know, those are things that that you will have to know when you when you um, during the sem as you teach. Asynchronously, check-ins can still be done. What I do is that I ask a question, and then um, because I use Google Classroom for my online classes, um, I make sure that the the check-in questions are um, asked in such a way that the students will see each other's answers and then they can converse. Kasi kung mag-check in sila pero ako lang yung nakakakita ng sagot, um, bali wala, no? Yung, yung, para, nag-build ka ng relationship with a student, yes. But you also would want them to build relationships with others. Sabi ko nga eh, um, kunwari ito, yung posting photos in virtual classes. I, I often ask my students to post their photos and their, prof uh, their profile pictures because I don't want it na a uh, year from now magkakasalubong kami sa college tapos di ko siya kilala pero parang ano uh, what do you call that mga kachat mo ganyan online uh, pen pal um, we don't want things like that no? so so let's build real relationships with our students and then provide opportunities for conversations to thrive and give feedback on submitted works um, that's also how I I solidify my relationships with my students because I give them feedback. Not always timely feedback. It's something that I, I still aspire for, but feed, I give feedback nonetheless. Um, iba yung dating na, na, na binimessage ka ng professor mo about your work and then encouraging you. So, you know, um, 
um, let's take this opportunity to, to strengthen our relationships with our students. And then for teaching learning expectations, let your students know how learning happens in your class. For me, um, I actually design my class because I teach educational psychology. So I have theories and then, kasi di ba, ano ba ang sense ng ed psych? It's, it's um, being able to use theories and then make decisions um, as, you, as you teach. So um, what I do is uh, at the start of the SEM, I show my students um, a basic, uh, well, my, my calendar for the semester. Um, I show them ano yung outline, ano yung mga pag-uusapan per session. And then I communicate to them how, how the classes will be structured. So I've been using a lot of graphic organizers this semester. Um, if you're unfamiliar with graphic organizers, they're actually just, um, you know, they're visual representations. It can be charts, it can be tables, but the things that, that um, visual things that, te uh, that students can use, and then they, they plug in the, uh, the, the things that they learn, yung mga personal notes nila, pinaplug in yun, dun sa graphic organizers. And then it helps um, it helps them make sense of their readings. So it's it's a sort of a mind map. And later I'll show you examples of this. Um, actually, later I will be showing also a Google Drive link where you can download my presentation. And then I'll give you some um, um, examples also of graphic organizers that you can download, but only up to Sunday. Yeah, and after Sunday, I close ko na po yung, yung link. So later, please take note of the of that link. So yun. So um, visuals, I've been using a lot of them because I don't want to just give my students readings. I want to make sure that they understand what they read or they understand the videos that I ask them to to watch. So I don't. Uh, um, as a teacher, ayoko nang palaging magbasa ng essay. <laughs> Um, my class right now, I, uh, there are 30 in my class, and that's just one class. I also have a graduate. Um, I have I, I have graduate um, uh, level classes. I have thesis advices. I also have my own dissertation. So I don't want to spend most of my time reading and reading and reading. Sabi nga ni Sir Greg, dalawa lang yan. Babasahin mo, tas wala ka ng oras para sa ibang bagay, or hindi mo babasahin, tas manghuhula ka lang. But then that would be doing a great disservice to our students. So what I do is I use visuals. So I show them, I give a lot of scaffolds, I give them templates, and then ang gagawin na lang nila, papasok nila lahat ng naintindihan nila. And then what I do is I check, okay, tama ba yung naintindihan nila? Tama ba yung relationships that they that they um, gathered from the readings or from the, the videos that I showed? And then, so that's when the te teaching learning experience happens. It's in giving feedback. Pag nakita kong, mm, parang medyo kailangan ng konting correction to. So that's when I individually um, give them feedback. So doon nagkakaroon ng conversation. And and by doing so, by, by communicating that process early in the SEM, um, it's also a way of telling my students that, you know, I'm not, um, I'm still teaching. <laughs> Hindi ito yung nagbigay ka lang ng readings, wala ka namang ginawa. Kasi, you, I, I still will have to process how they process the information that I, that I gave them. Okay? So, yun ang, yun ang sense ng, um, one, you have to explain what's gonna happen in your class. So, communicate, um, either your instructional design, and a good instructional design is something that um, Sir Greg uh, um, presented earlier, uh, the TEACH uh, framework. That's a very good design because I think that that is a, um, it's a holistic way of, of um, ensuring that the student's uh, learning is not just surface level. So meron kasing application, may assessment portion doon, may challenge, harness. So yun ang mga gusto natin. Um, and that would dictate also the kind of, of uh, sessions that you will be conducting in the next um, in the next weeks. Um, I also discussed submissions and rubrics. Very very important that students will know how they will be graded. Um, there is mixed 
feedback about this, mixed opinions. A lot of people, uh, there are some teachers who think, wag mong bigyan ng rubrics kasi pag binigyan mo ng rubrics, ano na lang, di gagawin na lang ng studyante para sa grade. But I beg to disagree. I think the rubrics is, um, you know, how you construct your rubrics should also evolve. It should also change. So if you ask your students um, to, to uh, submit a certain requirement, they at least have to see, know, it, it's not just how much they will be graded, but it, it becomes an instructional tool for them so that they know na, ah, okay, so ito yung mga kailangan lumabas dun sa requirement ko. And so when you check, then you know that uh, parang, parang mababawasan yung moments na, di ba, you have, sometimes you get submissions from your students sa parang, saan ba kinuha to? <laughs> parang hindi niya naintindihan yung sinabi ko. So um, having a clear set of rubrics um, that is not too specific, but, you know, um, open enough so that there is still room for creativity in, in the requirements. That, I think, is an effective tool in managing the class because that would lessen the questions regarding um, paano po gagawin ito, anong ibig sabihin ng ganyan, pwede po ba ito, ganyan. So, so um, I also find, though, that if you give them too much room for, uh, too, if you be, um, give requirements that are too open, too creative, students also don't know what to do with that. So give them enough structure so that there is room for creativity and for originality and uniqueness of works and requirements, but also um, the, the main um, elements of the requirements are still present, okay? And then for asynchronous sessions, you can also do the same thing, except you to just translate it um, virtually. So I, what I do is I post my course outline and learning plan with the schedule at the start of the semester. It's available for everyone to see. And then I make sure to follow that schedule. If I do have to deviate, I tell them how the deviation will take place and what's going to happen when we adjust the schedule. So I know eh, um, one of the key elements of, of good classroom management is having students who will know what's going to happen. Diba? Nagkakaroon kasi ng confusion pag hindi nila alam kung ano yung next na mangyayari. Um, kasi kung ikaw rin naman, diba? Kung ikaw yung estudyante, hindi mo alam kung ano yung mangyayari next week. Parang nakaka... nakaka uh, it's disconcerting, no? Um, and it, it becomes confusing also. And when you, again, when you're confused, you start to ask so many questions that deviate from the main, the, the essentials. So we want to lessen those opportunities. So kung pwedeng, i-organize mo na yung, yung virtual class mo in such a way na nandiyan na lahat, wala na kayong tanong, <laughs> that would be the best way to manage your class. Um, again, graphic organizers is very important. So what I do in Google Classroom is I give them a template and then I just click that, that, Um, option na all student uh, make make a copy for each student so that when the students click that link pipila pa na lang nila so parang parang online virtual work, uh, worksheets uh, and then again explain the intention of the tasks this again this also is another instructional tool that i find that i find useful um, now that we're doing remote learning when students know exactly Uh, why this task is being given, nag-iiba yung way nila of answering, um, nababawasan yung questions, nagiging very focused yung mga tanong kung meron man, and then um, tumataas din yung, kumbaga gumaganda rin yung quality nung gawa nila, tumataas yung standards because they know exactly why this task is being given to them. Hindi yung nanghuhula sila na make an essay. E para sa yung essay, ano ba ang tinitignan dito? So, so when I post my requirements, I tell them, um, oh, this task is for you to acquire knowledge. So, uh, and then I give them a time on task. So ito, show time on task. Um, I tell them, okay, this session, uh, this particular requirement is for 30 minutes only. So in 30 minutes na yun, don't give me a requirement or a submission na pang, parang pang tatlong oras ginawa. Kasi kung tatlong oras ginawa, ibig sabihin tatlong oras mo rin babasahin. If very, very simple lang pala yung gusto mong mangyari from that requirement. So 
um, those have to go hand in hand. What is the, the task intent? Uh, what is the intention of this particular task? And then tell them yung expected number of minutes or hours na gusto mong um, pagtrabahuhan nila yung requirement na yun. And then again, discuss your rubrics and give as much as possible timely feedback and then correct as necessary. Regarding time, so I'd like to um, uh, highlight yung time on task. So protect and leverage your time. Time is important for students, but time is equally important for teachers. We don't want to focus too much on one class na neglect may iba mong classes because we all know as teachers in the college and in higher education, we're not usually just given one class. So you want to make sure that you, you have energy that is equal to all of your classes. Kasi kung hindi, meron ka masyo short change ng mga estudyante. And we want to avoid that. So um, how do I manage time synchronously? I establish a schedule again at the start of the SEM. I'm consistent in following it or as much as possible, I try to be consistent. Again, pag may deviations, tell them ahead of time or within that time frame na um, meron tayong mamimiss, but don't worry, this is what's to be expected next time. Okay? That also lessens the anxiety of our students. You know, having, having the teachers know exact, uh, tell you exactly what's going to happen. And then plan ahead. So for example, synchronous sessions, um, gusto mo, ba, mo bang magpa-attendance? Kung ang, i, i, uh, ako kasi ang ginagawa ko, um, it depends no, on, on, on my class, ano yung need ng class, um, ano rin yung, yung intention ng lesson ko. Um, most of my synchronous sessions, again, are just for relationship building and it's an opportunity for students to ask questions. So ako, I make time. I actually provide much time with attendance because ang ginagawa ko when i ask this when i call the students for roll call um i that also is an opportunity to check in so i hit two birds with one stone i ask them to check in one at a time synchronously but um as they answer the check in question i also take note of their attendance okay pero yun ay dahil yun ang yun ang intention ko sa sa class it's to build relationships but for example, I have my my classes in my in in the master's program in Miriam, um, and in Miriam College, um, for for College of Education, we only meet for uh, because we, we do modular um, um, courses. We only have four sessions per course, and so I want to make sure pag imimit ko sila for an hour or two, jam pack yon. Uh, so sometimes what I do is I. Um, if if kailangan talaga na buong session ay pure lecture siya, I tell them ahead of time so that they can mentally prepare themselves na makikinig ako for the next two hours. Or if it's mostly um, a, a workshop or a write shop type of session, then I also tell them that. So pag ganun, hindi na ako nagpapa-attendance. I just, I, I mean, I don't ask for, for long check-ins because um, you adjust as, as needed, no? Um, you start on time and end on time and make sure you give bio breaks. Bio breaks like, uh, like um, pang, pangatlong session na po ako today. Sana po nakapag banyo kayo or uminuman lang kayo or maybe you, you're eating as you're, you're listening to me. So that's fine. No? But um, um, let's also communicate that to our students. So para hindi sila nga, diba, we don't want to meet our students. Bihira na nga lang tapos stressed pa sila every time they meet us. So let's try to make it as fun, um, but also as relevant as possible. We don't want to waste their time um, in as much as we don't want to waste our time. Okay, so um, two hours maximum sana. Um, and kung pwedeng hindi siya full lecture for the, for the entire two hours, that would be great. Um, and then record your session. One of the most, um, uh, one of the features that I'm most thankful for is the record button here on Zoom and uh, in Google Meet. Because then um, I could just post the recorded session for those who missed the class, and then I don't have to repeat things. So panu na lang nila. 
Um, some teachers, some professors are apprehensive about uh, recording the session and uh, kasi ang feeling nila, eh, magre-record naman ng session, eh, di hindi na lang mag- mag-a-attend yung mga estudyante. So, make it worthwhile to attend that session synchronously. Diba? Para gustuhin nila, like, for example, or now is the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, or we have an activity and this is what to expect. Para, para, um, ang default mindset nila ay, a-attend ako. Hindi yung magbimake ako ng excuse. Okay? For asynchronous sessions, again, follow a routine that respects individual contexts. Um, know that there are some students who prefer working early in the morning. There are some who hindi mo makakausap, makakausap during the day. Merong iba kung ano yung sinabi mong schedule. If you do face-to-face, ganun niya gagawin yung sessions. So it depends. Um, there are some who take care of their, their parents. There are some who are isolated kasi nag, nag karon ng exposure with a covid patient so we don't know unless we ask questions every time so um in that sense let's be realistic about our time on task now for time on task what i do sabi kanina ni sir greg no um pag nagpost kayo ang nagbigay kayo ng readings binabasa niyo ba yung readings sobrang dami ba nung readings um what i do is actually um and i'd like to to give uh, the proper credit here for my class for my class in educational psychology in UP most of the readings and the, the um, resources came from my colleague Dr. Uh, Lizel Oligario um, and and she she deliberately shared the readings with us because we're teaching the same class so para iisa yung nakikita nilang lahat no but at the same time what I appreciated about this is that the, the the resources have uh, the references have been very much curated so that isang topic isang reading lang or um isang reading isang video ganun lang siya hindi siya yung do this do this do, read that etc tapos after noon hindi na nila alam kung ano yung gagawin kasi nahilo na sila from all the reading so one reading lang and then one one video and the video means an ano fit mahaba ng 15 minutes sobrang haba na noon um usually 10 minutes max um kasi maso supplement naman yung yung video ng reading and then what i do is i go through the task myself kasi syempre kailangan alam ko yung yung binibigay kong readings right so i go through the task myself i time myself so for example if it takes me 15 minutes to to read or to finish reading this article times four so 50 times four well, ilan yun? Siyempre math, no? 15 times four 60 minutes yeah <laughs> uh, one hour um most likely for my students to work on this so yung time on task ko is actually me doing it times three or times four depending on the the mix of my class my 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 students. And um, bakit times three or times four? Kasi, kasi nga, minsan, hindi mo alam kung ano yung context. So, for example, ikaw, field mo yan eh, expertise mo yan. So, you read it, you understand it right away. Students might be reading this for the first time and, and you know, they, they don't really understand this, the, the, the lecture. So, kailangan nilang ulit-ulitin. So, Pag, pag naulit nila after three readings, tsaka pa lang nila naintindihan. Consider that in the time on task. So, I tell my students at the start of the SEM, okay, um, had we done this face-to-face, one and a half hours, Tuesday, one and a half hours, Thursday sana tayo. So, what I'll be doing uh, for the SEM is giving you um, learning experiences, uh, learning sessions that will not exceed three hours. So ganun, ganun ko sinasabi na. And when I do that, I make sure yung time on task also considers their context. So if I do it for 15 minutes, ang ilalagay kong time on, on task would be one hour or maybe 30 minutes kung mabibilis yung mga students. So ganun, no? uh, time on task. And then again, record the session, post it, but make sure of your privacy settings and make sure also that you inform the students about how to, to treat how to treat um, the, the the modules or the online references that you give them. Um, use scaffolds, provide fixed options for requirements. Um, what I do is 
I give my students an option, usually a written option and a visual option. So, kunwari, I want them to do um, a case analysis or a case study. Yung mga writers um, who are not so much into Canva, what I do is I allow them to, to submit a full report. And then for those na struggling writers or hindi nila masyadong strength yun, pero magagaling with visual, with, um, yeah, with, with graphics or visual representations, um, I allow them to, to do a visual uh, submission. Pero yung rubrics ay pareho kasi the components will have to be present whether it's a full written report or a visual report. So, and then I, I just allow them to choose. So, um, you don't want them to provide too many options kasi, again, ikaw ang mahihirapan mo. And what we want, again, is um, effective classroom management. And then empathy and intuitive lesson planning. I'll go through this very quickly. Anticipate your students' behaviors in well-written lesson plans. So as you design, empathize with your students. And usually I do this by, um, you know, if, if you have a strong relationship with your students, madali for you to empathize and madali for you to, to um, anticipate possible questions that they may have. So um, again, communicate lesson objectives. Make sure that these are aligned with the course objectives and the learning outcomes. And then observe behaviors. Ako, pag nagsasynchronous, I have uh, a journal beside me. I take down notes. Um, something as simple as nicknames, calling them by their nickname. Minsan, for, for college students, ang laking bagay nun. Um, I have a student malayo yung nickname niya dun sa full name niya. And if I had not, and he he said during the synchronous session, I prefer to be called this. Um, kasi hindi, uh, yan, kahit malayo sa pangalan ko, this is what what I prefer to be called. So, note, para pagkausap ko siya in asynchronous sessions, I can address him properly. Okay, so, um, that's part of the relationship building of empathy also. And then project possible behaviors, again, for asynchronous sessions via observer uh, observer notes. Uh, empathy maps also. Um, putting yourself in the, the situation of the student and then finding out how they would respond. Will this be too, will, be, uh, will this reading be too heavy for them? Um, you know, you don't want to spoon feed them. You don't want to to, ano rin, to shortchange them or to water down your program. Kaya nga important yung making sure everything is aligned dun sa course objective at sa learning outcome para masigurado na it's still flexible learning but it's not a watered down curriculum. And then have others. If you have time and if you have willing people to do this, have others go through your virtual session and then take note of their feedback. Um, kasi maybe in your mind, naiintindihan ng mga estudyante, pero um, pag pinabasa mo sa iba, hindi pala nila naiintindihan yung sinabi mo. So, yan, if you could have other people give feedback as well, that would be fine. And then, uh, behavioral and academic standards. This is the last, no? Establish... Um, standards by communicating your expectations. So this is basically what I've been saying the entire morning, that um, we have to, to inform them of what are necessary, of what are expected. Um, for example, in behavior, model good behavior. So pag nag-synchronous session, kadress properly naman, hindi yung parang kagigising mo lang. Okay lang walang ligo, basta hindi mo kang walang ligo. <laughs> diba? So, um, um, dress properly um, because if you do so, mahihiya yung mga estudyante mo na, na sumipot ng nakasando lang. Di ba? Gusto natin we model our, um, the good behavior so that the others will also follow suit. Um, establish rules also on the chat box. Um, again, also with the use of camera and, and your microphone. Um, hindi naman kailangan lagi nakabukas ang cameras. But... Um, some depending on the philosophy mo as a as a teacher, no? but uh, make sure your students understand and don't take it against them if they don't want to switch on their cameras or if they don't want to answer or kung gusto nilang chat box na lang. Okay, um, yeah, let's not take it against them. And also discuss online etiquette. That is very important. Um, for example, like when I share my slides later to you, please do not use it to. 
teach your own classes. <laughs> uh, or maybe if you do, at least acknowledge that um, the slides came from me. So ganun, ganun klaseng mga um, ethical considerations also that students will have to be aware of now that we're doing things online. Um, it would be good to show exemplars of work or maybe have scaffolds um, for asynchronous sessions. Um, and then also online etiquette. Uh, I think this is a perfect time to teach our students this. Uh, we don't, we can't simply expect them na, na alam nila kung paano makipag-communicate sa inyo. So how to write emails. If they cannot, um, when, when do they start communicating with you via messenger? And kailan na dapat email? Kailan text? Uh, anong oras pwede? Yung mga ganun, I think, um, will have to be communicated. So, um, sorry, this is, I blurred it because it, um, so that you won't see the faces of my students. But this is a screenshot of my, my EdSight class. So, um, ito yung sinasabi kong, um, add, you, 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 the little things are important. So, this is actually a screenshot of our first Zoom synchronous session. So, I had everyone switch on their cameras and then yun yung, yun yung, um, picture namin, uh, an ba tawag dyan? That, sa Google Classroom. So, para, you know, nagkakakitaan pa rin kahit paano, we, we remember how each other looks like and um, it becomes easier for us to communicate as well. So, that can be, yeah, it's a simple thing that we can uh, incorporate in our own classes. Um, and then, have a structure. Ako, when, Actually, every sem, iba-iba yung itsura ng Google Classrooms ko. Kasi nga, whatever it is that I get from um, webinars such as this, I try to incorporate them. So parang, it's a learning process the entire uh, nine months. <laughs> no, the entire, um, yeah, the entire school year has been a learning process. And so those will have to translate um, in the things that you do. So for me, I've learned that um, it's important to have um, a, uh, a common way of doing things so that it becomes your structure for the class. And so ako, ang ginagawa ko, number ko um, para alam nila ano dapat ba yung unang babasahin so that everything will make sense. Hindi yung parang kung paano na lang uh, because that adds to the confusion. And again, um, if people are confused, if students are confused, then that you're, you're probably not doing a good job as um, in, in classroom management. And again, when classroom management suffers, learning will suffer. So let's simplify things for them. So sa akin, very standard yung aking um, um, posts every week. I have curated learning resources for every week. Two, three, at most four, four sessions lang yan. If I do have more than four um, um, uh, references, wala na akong task for the week. Kasi nga, I have what I call the time on task. So pag sinabi ko, okay, you're meant to read just this for three weeks, um, yun na yun. And then next week, kinukontian ko na yung reading tasks and then more on the, the processing. So again, everything is communicated. And how do I do that? So ito, yung sinasabi ko, when I do a check-in, so I... When I, when I post, I, um, I make sure I use language that, that's conversational so that it builds um, the relationship. Also, it builds rapport with your students. We don't want too formal language kasi especially, siguro for, for grad school, pwede pang formal. Pero, diba, we also want to humanize things um, now that we're doing things remotely. So, I have a check-in. So, um, sabi ko, and, and I make sure to, to tie each week together uh, to the next. So in the previous check-ins, I asked them how they felt, etc. So ngayon, um, I do something else. So um, let's force ourselves to look at the positives. So check-in for this week would be just to list down the three things that you're grateful for. And, you know, you can learn so many things by doing, by asking questions such as this. And then if you notice, so the intention here is very clear. It's to gain empathy and for us to have interaction with each other. And then estimated time on task, three to five minutes lang. So, wag, I mean, pag sumagot ka, huwag mo na masyadong pag-isipan. <laughs> Kasi three to five minutes lang to of your three hours for the week. Um, okay, this one. Another thing that I, I 
uh, found very helpful, very, very useful for this uh, SEM um, is giving them wellness activities. Uh, I don't want them to go, I don't want my students to go into my classes stressed. So I provide them the opportunities to relieve some of the stress. So in, um, for this week, instead of uh, a check-in, what I asked them to do was a wellness activity. So meron akong pinost na mga, well, a, a very quick reading, two minutes lang na babasahin about how breathing helps reduce our anxieties and stress. And then I ask them to watch a video, 10 minutes long. Pero sabi ko, okay lang, kasi yung 10 minutes na yun, ang ginagawa mo ay breathing. So it's something that will help the student relieve anxiety and some of the stress. So um, second, it's worth um, devoting 10 minutes to and then do box breathing. So the instructions are very clear. The task is very clear. The intention is to take deliberate steps toward mental wellness. And uh, I had very good feedback regarding this. A lot of the students were telling me, hirapan sila. Nahirapan sila kasi lalo silang na-stress. So doon ako nagpapasok ng, again, relationship building, but it's also um, a different way of teaching because I tell them, okay, if you're still stressed, that means you have to do this more often. Kasi that means nga na hindi na nade-detect ng, ng brain mo, kailan dapat nagsuslow down. And if you're in constant um, fight or flight mode, lagi kang survival mode, then... The cortisol levels are always up, and then that's when you feel anxiety, etc. So, so ganun. So it becomes a learning experience for them as well. Uh, I, I go beyond educational psychology, but although uh, indirectly it is still part of EdPsych, uh, which is the course that I'm teaching here. Um, but beyond this, it makes the session more human, and it conveys to the students that you actually are on their side hindi ka kalaban as the professor. So, yan. Um, we, I, I do mindfulness exercises. I, I teach them um, some of that. And then ito, ayan, um, so I tell them, okay, the intention is to acquire knowledge. So, ang estimated time on task dito is one hour. Um, so, just read through it. And then the next, number three, is a, their first task for the week, 15 points. Time on task is another hour, and then I teach them to analyze. So ito yung sinasabi kong use of graphic organizers. So um, it's it's a way of helping our students make sense of what they're learning. So it's actually a self-regulation tool um, and a metacognitive tool as well. So I tell them, for this task, ang gusto kong gawin ninyo mag-analyze. And when you analyze, these are what you have to do. You take things apart, identify the parts, and then organize them, etc. And so when um, they, they, they click on the, the um, that link that leads them to the template, ito yung may kita nila. So it's the embodiment, the representation of this one, which I, I told them about. So at the end of this session, the students learned how to properly analyze something, analyze theory, but it also showed me how much they understood Hoffman's theory of empathy. Kasi na breakdown na nila. So highly metacognitive. Um, and you know, metacognition is very important also kasi gusto nating mangyari na self-sufficient learners ang mga estudyante natin, especially at the higher education levels. So, Yan, I do a lot of this, graphic organizers. Um, next week, ibang graphic organizer naman, but same process. I teach them how to do it, and then I show them also, uh, I, I give the template, so this is the scaffold for the week. And then this is also where the monitoring and the feedback comes in. So when, pag na, dito ko nakikita, mm, kulang yung understanding niya, hindi niya na, natumbok yung pinaka-essence ng theory. And so this is when I give individual feedback. That's the relationship building. That's also when genuine learning takes place. And then this is the rubric. So I tell them, um, you know, identified themes, important, etc. So alam nilang 15 points ito. Um, and it's connected also to my um, the, the grades breakdown for the SEM. And then this is, I think this is my second to the last slide. 
um, this is how I introduce my options for um, for for my requirements. So this one, the intention is to inquire and to create. Uh, before the, I, I use inquire and create because at the start of the sem, I showed them a video. This is actually um, um, a framework by De Diana Laurie Lard, uh, six learning types. So I asked them to to view that video so that they understand what my my um, so that they understand the terms that I will be using throughout the sem. So alam na nila ano ibig sabihin ko pag sinabi kong inquire or pag sinabi create ano ang expectations. And then from there, estimated time on task, two hours. But I told them, two hours including the brainstorming or thinking part of this task. But the actual writing may only take 15 to 30 minutes. So nakikita nila how things are, uh, what are expected of them. Ano um, essentially yung magiging itsura. It's not supposed to be done as a full report right away. Um, hindi ina-expect na magbigay ng 20 pages. Kasi nga 15 to 30 minutes lang ang, ang actual writing. Okay, so um, it's basically communicating what you want, what are expected of them, and then giving them the option. So ito sinabi ko, you may do a full written report, pwedeng visuals, pwedeng slide presentation. Um, kahit ano pang format, please make sure that um, your submission has these two things, the, the critical issue and how different stakeholders are affected, and then meron akong reminders. So, ano yung ina-expect kong makuha at the end of the week? So, that is, and then, kung pag nakita nyo, five points lang yan. So, alam nila na, na okay, ito yung first part and, and um, it's okay if I don't give such an accurate submission. Kung merong, kung merong corrections, okay lang. Okay? So, it, it helps manage um, the session, it helps manage the learner's expectations. It helps manage your time and their time. And you um, you are able to give feedback all at the same time. There. So I'd like to end with this comic strip. Um, so sabi nung isang teacher, this is your classroom, Miss Jade. It's so orderly. And Miss Jade says, it has to be. What are these numbers on the desks? Sabi ni Ms. Jade, each student has one. It's how I keep track of all of the little buggers. And the teacher says, parang pampreso, di ba? Have you tried orange jumpsuits? And Ms. Jade says, yes, yeah, school the school board shot it down. What is the point of all of this? Um, classroom management, um, it can be very tedious, yes, but let us not forget the human component. At the end of the day, we are dealing with actual students um, who have their own contexts, who have their own ways of doing things, and who have actual feelings that need to be respected and considered and acknowledged. So let us be human among everything that is happening. No matter how detached we are, let's remember the human aspect of teaching. Thank you very much. That ends my presentation. If you would like to download this presentation, please go to this um, site. Uh, this link is, wait, I will also type it in the chat um, so that you can just access it. Um, I will give you only until Sunday to download. After this, I will be closing the link already. So I will include um, some of the uh, visual, uh, the graphic organizers that I use in my class. All right. So there, it's in the chat box. So if you would like to um, to download it along with other graphic organizers, you can. So thank you very much, and have a great week. Uh, have a have a great long weekend <laughs> starting tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Christina Nieves, or may I say, Teacher Christina, ma'am, for discussing diligently and comprehensively modeling effective classroom management in a asynchronous and synchronous learning mode. As you have said, we do things because there are reasons for doing so. Emphasizes the importance of positioning as well as checking for student safety, connection, rapport, rules and discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Professor Christina Nieves Aligada Halal, our last speaker.
please give her a virtual applause. Thank you. Now we move on to the open forum. In this portion, we are assisted by Dr. Ada Yunamok, uh, ATEI Business Manager, and Dr. Arnold Duping, ATEI PIO. They are our assistant moderators in this open forum. But in the interest of time, we will only accommodate one or two questions. But if you have more questions, you may send it through our email. You can send it through chadro11 at chadro.gov.ph and we will forward your questions to the speakers. So, let's start with the first question here. As we run down the chat box, we have uh, seen uh, only one or two questions. The first one, good morning. Can we ask for a recording of this presentation? Thanks, Chad. Yes, we are actually uh, uh, li uh, live at our Facebook page, so you can always view it in our page. Another question is uh, from Sir Peds Castillo to our second speaker, asking for soft copy and the presentation. And another question is, is familiarize with and know are these smart action verbs? Um, anyone from our speaker would like to answer? Familiar, uh, familiarize with. Kasi, kasi, okay, I, I'd like to put, put it this, this way. Usually, okay, ang tinuro sa atin is we look at the verbs. Okay, but if you if you if you see now how things are evolving in terms of the Bloom's taxonomy, it depends actually on how you 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 phrase the term. If that is required, if, if that is in the outcome, okay, it is not a debate whether that is uh, an acceptable verb or not. Okay, if that is what is written in the outcome, so be it, and we make sense of it. Okay, so. Bloom's taxonomy is just one. Okay, there are many taxonomies. Okay, things has its own. And I think that's the latest in 2020, in 2017, yung kay Fink's taxonomy, taxonomy of significant learning. The, the, the emphasis now of postmodern uh, or yes, a postmodern pedagogy is not really on the verb that is used, but it's on how we make sense of the, the outcomes and how it is connected with the outcomes of the, the curriculum. Kasi yung familiarize with, ano lang naman yun, para mong sinasabing identify. Parehas lang yun. Eh. It's just a semantics. So, this time we don't uh, debate anymore with in terms of the verbs that is used. It's the essence that's more important. Kaya tayo na to natatalo sa PISA eh, kasi tinitingin tayo sa verbs. Kaya na nabababa yung score natin sa PISA, sa basic ed. And I think that it, that also is our problem in terms of implementing what OBE is all about. We focus a lot of things on the verbs that we use. OBE is quality assurance. OBE is learning. It is not about verbs. Bloom's taxonomy gave those examples of verbs but the important message of Bloom, if you read the original paper of Bloom, is not about the verbs, but about the, uh, the quality of the, the behavior that you want, the exact behavior that you want, and at the same time, uh, what do you call this? The utility of the, 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 uh, not the utility. Simply the behavior that you want to, to teach and develop to your students. Please. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Um, I heard already. Sir? Yes, yes, ma'am. Please, please, uh, please proceed, po. Okay, thank you. Here it goes, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Pawilin answered the question. It's the essence that is more important and not on the verb we use. Now we have here the last question. How do we adjust with me and some of my students not being good with technology? This is from... Yasmin Gutierrez. The answer is the answer is with you. I think we cannot provide an answer with that. But I'm glad you realized because that's the, that's very that's the most difficult thing to do. Yung accepting that we do not know something or we do not know, <laughs> but but we are poor in technology actually. Pero well it. So tingin ko nag nag-start nag, nag na yung learning kasi the fact that you are accepting that you are poor with technology or poor at technology then that's the start of not adjusting but learning and relearning and learning a lot of things and take note technology is just a tool okay the best technology in the classroom actually is you whether this is virtual whether this is online or residential it's the teacher that's it. We are the best technology inside the, in, in our classroom. So yung pag-aaral ng technology, continuous yan. Okay, continuous yan. Kasi habang may, alam mo na ngayon, mamaya, alam mo, alam mo na yung LMS ngayon, mamaya meron pa rin sa susunod. Nadidevelop yan eh. Hindi natin matasabi na mamamaster natin ng technology. No, 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 no. Mas mabilis ang technology kaysa sa atin. But uh, just the realization that we need to learn more and there are more important facets of technology that we need to master. I think that's already a good start for me. Yeah. For for me also, sir, if I may add, um, yeah. the sooner the better. Uh, I find that ano po, the less apps nga, someone said that earlier, the less apps you use, the better in a session. Kasi po, ang nangyayari, um, well, I tried before, no, naglalagay pa ako ng mga link. Um, not everyone accesses our classes using a laptop. Yung iba po phone. So, ang nangyayari, meron kang ang tech pero yung estudyante mo nalilimit nung tech na yon so um you want to simplify things um when i started when we started on the lockdown ano po um marunong ako ng google classroom but i didn't i didn't know parang ano eh the, the google classroom i think is one of the easier apps to to um learn how to use pero the the I love it because it it um, allows you to work on so many things. Um, and ang importante po doon yung teacher. Paano ginagamit ng teacher yung yung uh, app. So for me, ano po, um, basta po nakafocus tayo doon sa ano ba yung gusto nating mangyari. Ano yung intention ng task. Um, in my experience, nag-technology, nag, um, dadagdag lang ako ng app kung masyadong tedious na yung ginagawa. But even then, kung masyadong tedious yung ginagawa nyo, maybe um, sign yun na kailangan mong i-adjust din yung binibigay mo. <laughs> Kasi di ba po, kung ano yung input mo as teachers, malamang yun din yung output ng estudyante. Tapos babalik rin yun sa'yo pag ikaw yung nag-check. So, let's simplify and let's not be um, too tied up with technology. Yan po ang akin. Okay, thank you to our respective speakers for answering our participants' questions. But before I will proceed to the next part of the program, I'd like to share some comments coming from our participants here. I'll just run down no, in very short uh, time. I, uh, the speaker is making me realize that I am doing the right thing, compassion and flexibility. We give too much focus on how things should be done instead of, instead of what needs to be done. So enlightening. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dr. Pawilin, for the enlightenment on lots as equally significant because we are asked to choose only hats, which I find to be the defeating the purpose of proper instructions as we neglect the foundational knowledge and not all learners are the same. 
So again, thank you, dear participants, for all your questions and active participation. Thank you also, Dr. Ada and Dr. Arnold, for the assistance. Uh, can we have a virtual round of applause? This is for everyone, please. Yes, thank you. In this juncture, we will now award the e-certificate of recognition to the resource persons. Ladies and gentlemen, to award the e-certificate of recognition to our three brilliant speakers, my call on the education supervisor two, supervisor in charge for the teacher education program in Chad Region 11. Please help me welcome Dr. Evelyn S. Eckley, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Take it away, ma'am. Congratulations to our three speakers this uh, today. Uh, very robust in kanilang uh, presentation, no? and it's really informative. So, congratulations. So, to award the certificate of recognition, may I read a citation? Republic of the Philippines, Office of the President, Commission on Higher Education, Regional Office 11. This certificate of recognition is hereby awarded to our first speaker this morning, um, Dr. Jonah Marie Lim, for generously sharing his expertise, time as a resource person during the conduct of the CHED 11 webinar on empowering teachers with new strategies in the new normal. With the topic, Creative Strategies for Teaching Student Teachers in a Flexible Learning Mode. Signed, um, among the administrators and faculty of higher education institutions in Region 11, held on November 26 and 27, 2020, via Zoom platform and Facebook Live. Issued this 27th day of November 2020 at Davao City, Philippines. Signed, Dr. Maricar R. Casquejo, Marika R. Casquejo, PhD, CESO 3, Director 4. The same certificate, congratulations, the same certificate with the same citation is also awarded to uh, Dr. Greg Fabius Pawilin with the title Evolution of Pedagogy and Teacher Education at the Period of COVID 19 pandemic. Fourth time Dr. Marika R. And another, the same citation will be awarded to Professor Christina Aligada Halal with the title Modeling Effective Classroom Management in the Signed, Marika Arcasquejo, PhD, CESU 3. Congratulations to all of you. May I now turn over to the facilitator, Dr. Elisa Suan. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn, and thank you once again to our respective speakers. We are blessed to have you today and hope to see you again in our future webinars. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. As Gary Ryan said, has said, what people remember is the beginning and the end, how we start and how we finish. Therefore, start fast and finish strong. To speak for the closing remarks, may I call on our CHED Regional Office 11 Supervising Education Program Specialist, Dr. Christopher Pio O. Polito, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Good noon, participants, uh, fellow educators. Our resource speakers, namely Dr. Jonah Marilim of St. Scholastica's College. For Greg Fabio Stovil of uh, UP Los Banos, Professor Christina Aligada Halal of Miriam College, thank you for gracing today's webinar. My acknowledgement to Rex Bookstore as partner of CHED in this webinar, namely Attorney Dominador Buhain, the president of Rex Bookstore. Ms. Cheer Morales, National Sales Manager for Tertiary Materials Division. Mr. Ronald Eugenio, Regional Sales Manager for Mindanao for Higher Education Division. And to the Association of Teacher Education Institutions, thank you very much. Right now, we are about to end 
Ched 11, webinar number 13, Empowering Teachers with New Strategies in the New Normal, Day 2. Therefore, we ask ourselves, how are this series of webinars that we have attended relevant to our professional functions as educators? These are the questions that we have to answer ourselves. In other words, Ched and the series of webinars can only lead us the way, but it is us, it is you who shall walk through it. Our webinar's topic today addresses the long-standing concern of the Commission no? when remote online or distance education is implemented. That is why distance education, according to CMO number 27, series of 2005, is not for all HEIs. There are qualifications that HEIs need to have for the very reason that there are constraints such as qualified manpower and up-to-date infrastructure and facilities for it to be effective. Hence, quality is a main issue here as far as the Commission is concerned. However, in the age of internationalization and the COVID-19 pandemic, these former alternative modes of learning have become the norm, the new normal as they call it, and the CHED together with the HEIs must be up for it and develop standards. As far as the Commission on Higher Education is concerned, online learning is one of the learning modalities that higher education institutions can consider when implementing flexible learning and teaching. According to CMO number no. 4 of 2020, otherwise known as the guidelines on the implementation of flexible learning, and other learning modalities also include blended learning and, of course, offline education. Our recent challenge, which we consider as a valid concern, is the unrealistic academic requirements of some professors that are detrimental to other subjects or other professors of the students. Certainly, we would want professors to be more lenient and considerate in this time of change and paradigm shift, as far as the mode of delivery is concerned. As Dr. Pavilion discussed earlier, more on summative assessment and assessment. However, I also learned for a fact that some of our teachers experience, needless to say, some students don't mind about the formative assessment side because for some schools, Formative assessments are not graded. Therefore, this second sem, some institutions are contemplating of grading formative assessments and exempting the students from taking the summative assessment if they get higher marks for their formative assessments. So that is how diverse our experiences are in the implementation and delivery of teaching or flexible learning in the new normal. At this point, let me congratulate the CHED personnel who are behind today's webinar. Namely, Dr. Evelyn Eckle, our supervisor in charge for teacher education. Dr. Cesar Adege, our supervisor in charge for humanities, social science, and communication and liberal arts. Dr. Lisa Swan, our moderator for today for health and related programs, and Engineer Rodrigo Pangantihon for IT, or information technology programs. Earlier, we reached a total of 300 participants. So congratulations to all of you. And on behalf of the Commission, through our Regional Director, Dr. Maricar Arcasquejo, and our Chairman, Dr. J. Prospero de Vera, we would like to thank our sponsors, namely Rex Bookstore, and the resource speakers for sharing with us your knowledge and wisdom on the topic at hand. And to you, our loyal webinarians, certainly number 13, the 13th webinar of CHED is a lucky number as far as we are concerned, considering that today is also a Friday. So thank you very much for your usual support and stay safe.
Thank you, Dr. Chris, for that uh, very informative closing remarks. Thank you once again, Commission on Higher Education, Region 11, and Rex Bookstore Incorporated, and the Association of Teacher Education Institutions. Um, after this, there is an evaluation link that will be flashed. Please be reminded on the email address and names not to type it correctly. Please type your email address and names so that uh, all names and emails are correct that will be uh, forwarded to our office. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Dr. Lisa Crudas Wan. We'll say thank you very much and have a good day, everyone.